Fair Scrutiny and Policy Development Committee. Um, I'm going to ask Jenny Skiba, first of all, to outline as far for the public what the purpose of the meeting is and, and, and the sort of rules and regs around it. Over to you, Jenny. Hi. Thank you for logging into this Zoom video conference of the Healthier Communities and Adult Social Care Scrutiny Committee. I am the Democratic Services Officer for this meeting and I'm assisted by my colleague Kate Sheldon, who is the host of the virtual meeting. We will proceed to introductions and housekeeping in a moment, but just a couple of points to note. This is a meeting public and in alignment with the new regulations which permit meetings to be held by remote means will be live streamed for the public to view. Sheffield Live are also intending to broadcast parts of this meeting. To make the meeting run as smooth as possible, can I please ask the participants in the virtual meeting room to leave your microphone on mute when you are not speaking. When you want to speak, please raise your hand to the camera, only on mute when the chair indicates that you can speak. Uh, the host of the meeting will bring in any speakers into the virtual room at the appropriate time. If at any time any member loses the ability to hear or be heard, they must alert the chair or the host as soon as possible. You may see members looking to the left and right of their screens. This is because they may not be looking at an additional screen or advice containing the agenda papers, not because they are distracted. I will now hand over to the chair of this meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Jenny. I'm going to start off with introductions. I'm going to go around the screen in the order that I can see you. As we know, everybody's screen will look different. So the first one I've got for introductions is Gary. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councillor Gary Weatherall for Shire Green Brightside Ward. Dr. Edney. Hello, my name is Trish Edney and I'm representing Healthwatch. I'm on the advisory group of Healthwatch. Emily. I'm Emily Stanbrookshaw, the policy and improvement officer that supports this committee. Thank you, Jean. Councillor Jane Dunn, Saudi Ward. Talib. Councillor Talib Hussain, Wendy Ward. Adam, please. Yeah, uh, Councillor Adam Hurst from uh, West Ecclesfield. Gail. Gail, could you unmute, please? Unmute. Sorry. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, Councillor Smith from Mosborough Ward. Vic, please. Vic Bowden, Councillor for East Ecclesfield. Sean Ed. Uh, Councillor Sean Admire Richards representing uh, Manor and Castle. And Angela, sorry, sorry, Sean Ed. Angela? Good afternoon, uh, Councillor Angela Argentio from uh, Broomhill and Sharavale. Martin? Councillor Martin Phipps for City Ward. Heather? Heather Burns, I'm Acting Assistant Di Director within Sheffield CCG within the Mental Health Commissioning Team, but that's a, a joint post shared with Sam Martin uh, across an integrated team with Thank CCG you, and local authority. Thank you, Heather. Steve? Good afternoon. I'm Steve Harris. I'm uh, Councillor for Graves Park Ward and uh, I'm the Deputy Chair of this uh, scrutiny committee. Sue? So, uh, Councillor Sue Alston, uh, Councillor for Fullwood Ward. Jan? Hello, I'm Jan Ditheridge, Chief Executive for Sheffield Health and Care Trust. Alan. Alan Winsell, um, Chief Nurse, Acting Chief Nurse for Sheffield CCG. Steve. Hi everyone, Steve Thomas, I'm a GP and I'm Clinical Director at the uh, Clinical Commissioning Group. You also look as though you've got the most comfortable chair in the house. <laughs> hey Sam. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sam Martin. I'm Head of Commissioning for Vulnerable People uh, at the Council, and, and I'm currently sharing the interim arrangements around the Transformation Programme for Mental Health with Heather, as she explained earlier on. George. George, could you unmute, please? We can't hear you. Um, I'm George North Hammond. I'm the Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care. Mike. Councillor Mike, General Collector Member for Richmond. 
John Doyle, Director of Strategy and Commissioning of the City Council. Thank you, everybody. Um, those of you who are watching the meeting will realise that uh, we're not all, uh, not all councillors who are members of the, of, of the uh, committee here. We've also got people who are going to be uh, doing um, presentations and responding to our questions uh, during the rest of the meeting. So do we have any apologies for absence, please? Just one apology from Councillor Louis Dagnell, uh, Councillor Shannon Mayor Richards and his substitute. Uh, I think we've also had uh, um, uh, um, an apology from uh, from Jackie. Mm. All right, note to Chair. Okay, I, I had Jackie Satter, so I'm sorry if that didn't get to you, but I got it through the WIPS office, so it's just not come through properly. Uh, okay. Chris, you indicated. Yes, it's an apology from Lucy, and I'm here instead. Thank you. Uh, do we, we've, we have no items on the agenda which require the exclusion of public and press. Do we have any declarations of interest in the, um, in the items that we're going to be discussing today? Mike, Councillor Mike Drabble. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, just like to let the committee know that, and the public know that I am uh, a councillor. I uh, work in mental health part of the week, including in the NHS. So that just may be relevant to sort of uh, today's business. So I'm guided by the uh, chair of the committee on, uh, you know, what contribution I can make. Well, that doesn't sound like a, are you. You're not employed by the NHS, on are you? I, I, I work at a GP surgery for part of the week. Okay, um, can we make a note of that, Jenny? Uh, can I just check your advice on that, Jenny? That doesn't sound to me like a prejudicial interest. No, I think it's more of a personal interest, Chair. Yes. Yeah, so we'll record it, Mike. Mike, can I just suggest when you're speaking that you sit back a little bit because we're getting a bit of muffling from your from, from the sound. Okay. Okay, thanks. Good evening, Chair. Oh, <laughs> maybe it's your low voice. Uh, Councillor Steve Arias, I've got you. Can, what do you want to? Come in here. Could you unmute yourself, please? Unmute yourself, Steve, please. Sorry, the space bar wasn't working. Uh, just to say that I am um, local authority um, appointed um, uh, member of the Council of Governors of Sheffield Health and Social Care Trust. Uh, it's not a major interest, no. but I thought it ought to declare that. Thank you. Adam, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I'm on the uh, uh, adult health and social, the, the same one as Steve Ayres, and I'm also on the nomination and remuneration subcommittee of that trust. So I don't think that's, um, I don't get any remuneration for it, but. The, the rules are if you're representing the council on a particular body, then um, that's not a prejudicial interest, but you, it's okay. good to declare it as well. So thank you for that. Moving on now to the minutes of the previous meeting. As per usual, I'm going to go through these. Oh, first of all, can I take them um, as a correct record? Does anybody have any problems with the minutes as a correct record, personally? Everybody happy with those? Okay, so I'll take those as a correct record of the meeting, an accurate record. Uh, I'm going to go through a page at a time for matters arising. Just put your hand up if there's anything that you want to raise. So I'm going to start with page five, which is the first minute uh, page of the minutes. Page five, six, seven, eight, nine. I, th I think we have something on 6.6e, Emily, just to note that the letter has gone to um, all Sheffield MPs yes, based it on the... Sent. Yes, it has been sent. Um, anything else on those minutes? Last page 10? No? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, public questions and petitions. We have received some questions in advance. Do we have somebody from Save Our NHS uh, here to ask those questions. Do we have anybody? Uh, Jenny, have you been notified of anybody? Um, Kate, has anybody come from Save Our NHS to ask the questions? Nope. I'll take it from the silence. 
I think they were um Jeremy Short was planning to attend. Yeah, I'm not sure Short. if he's in is he in the waiting room to come in, Kate. Yes. Oh, okay. Can you write him in then, please? He's coming in, Chair. Thank you. Hi. Hello, Jeremy. Right. I, I, I'm Kate. I know we've met before. I'm cheering. Yes, yes, we have. We've, yes. Got, your, we've got your questions. Can I just, uh, but the rest of the committee won't have them. There's quite a long preamble. Can I just ask you to sort of ask the questions if you don't mind? Yeah, um, yes, okay. I'll be as brief as possible. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we started formulating these two or three months ago. Um, when it was clear that the pandemic uh, was going to create a, a lot of demands on mental health. And at the same time, the CQC report to come out uh, on the trust. So we were concerned about those things. So that explains a bit of the preamble because it was actually put together two or three months ago. Uh, and we were aware of um, work that has been done um, already on, on COVID and um, uh, on the trust uh, in response to the CQC report, but I, we think there's still sort of some fundamental questions. Uh, the first one, uh, we're in three groups really, the first one relates to um, how is the scrutiny committee confident uh, that given the performance of, of the trust, over, particularly over the last two years, that it can actually fulfil uh, the correct strategy uh, indeed and with um, the issues and increased demand from COVID, um, particularly in regard to resources, uh, supplies of PPE, uh, testing, and um, the resumption of face-to-face -face, uh, consultations. So that's the first sort of set of questions. Um, the second relates to uh, the report itself. Um, and uh, in the first one, we, uh, we have not seen any actual apology, I think, from the Trust uh, over its poor performance. They've said they're, they, they're disappointed as if it's not their responsibility. And we wonder if the Scrutiny Committee thinks it's appropriate for the Trust to apologise particularly to its users. Uh, secondly, there were 47 breaches of legal requirements found, uh, and how many of these have been rectified to date? Uh, thirdly, uh, my wife's actually a member of the Trust, and she, so she gets the Involved magazine. Uh, in the latest one, it said that we could get an update on progress uh, on the Trust website. Um, but uh, but uh, as far as I can see, there's been no update since 29th of April. So no information on progress other than plowing through the, the Board of Directors uh, papers. Um, and we've there's a number of particular concerns on mixed sets accommodation, uh, the, the number of inpatient beds, uh, awareness of staff to speak up guardian, guard, guardian. And I'm aware that the, the trust has, has carried out some work on the mandatory training and uh, experienced staff issues, uh, but we're hoping that this would be a, a uh, continuing, you know, they're not just meeting the target temporarily to fulfil the requirements, but that uh, that, that will be continuing. And, and finally, um, we're wondering if the council would consider establishing an actual in, in inquiry involving users and workers uh, into the actual running of the trust, uh, given what's happened. Uh, the final set of questions relates to finance. Um, there have been cuts over several years, although the Trust say that the deterioration in services is not due to cuts, but a lot of the recent issues seem to stem from the efficiency programme um, two years ago uh, when they were looking to achieve £7.1 million pounds in savings, uh, and that resulted in the uh, Unison uh, members voting for strike action towards the end of last year. This is obviously a very serious step for workers in mental health to take. Um, the, the last two years uh, accounts show that the trust has actually made a cumulative £10 million to £51 million. Pounds. So what we'd like uh, uh, an answer to is, is the fact, you know, why, 
why was this allowed to happen at a time over the last two years when services were seriously deteriorating that the trust seemed to be putting uh, 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 money aside. So those are the, you know, that's a, a sort of summary uh, of the detailed questions. So I hope that's okay. Now, thank you very much and for Sarah and NHS Sheffield for uh, putting together these questions and submitting them and to you for coming and answering them. Um, what we normally do, because it's Ruth that's been before, um, with your agreement, um, there's a couple of questions in here which I can answer. There'll be others that, um, th these questions have been shared with the Health and Social Care Trust in advance. So there'll be some of them that they will answer in the course of, of, of their introduction and so on when, with their presentation. And there'll be some that will come out of the uh, subsequent discussion. So any questions that haven't been answered through those, that process, we will respond to in writing, or at least most of these are actually for the Health and Social Care Trust that we will agree with them subsequently. If there are any questions that haven't been answered, you will get a written answer to those, and that will go into the public domain and obviously shared with the other members of scrutiny. Is that acceptable to you as an approach? Uh, yes, that's fine, thanks. Okay, okay. So uh, can I just sort of comment on a couple of them which refer specifically to scrutiny? Um, and the first one, <clears throat> excuse me, is how confident uh, scrutiny is that the trust is capable of delivering. Well, to be honest, that's one of the reasons why we're having um, this meeting and why we will have, why we will have subsequent meetings. So I, I can't comment on that at this point in time because that's why we're here. Um, and if we're not com uh, confident at the, you know, uh, subsequently, then obviously we will uh, take appropriate action in those circumstances. So I can't really comment on that because that would be prejudging um the um the session that we're having today um on the issue about the um asking for an apology to be honest i think that's up to the trust it's not for scrutiny to do that i think it's really up to the trust to make that decision for themselves it's not for us actually to oppose it and to be honest if you ask if we ask somebody to apologize that wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a you know um what you're looking for anyway and the third issue is around the independent inquiry. Now, there is a set of arrangements, which is um, 2E on your questions. This, there is a set of regulatory arrangements around this because the CQC um, is actually in charge of this particular um, arrangement and so on, and they're the regulators. So it's not really at this stage for scrutiny, I think, to get directly involved. However, if we feel that appropriate improvement isn't being made, not necessarily today, but over a process that, that, that we will set in place, then, then um, we, we would therefore want to take action because the ultimate action for the um, uh, scrutiny committee is to refer something to the Secretary of State. I'm not saying we're going to do that. I hope we will never get to that point. So in the first instance, my response to you is that it's up to the, the CQC to take responsibility for the regulation of the trust in the first instance. So at this stage, the, I would not be recommending to scrutiny that, that we take further action unless they are really, really concerned about what they hear today. Okay, well, thank you for that. And, and with your... Um, uh, I'm hoping that you'll stay with us and, and, and be able to um, uh, uh, watch the um, uh, proceedings and so on and hopefully um, get your questions answered. So um, thank you again, Jeremy. So we're going to move on now to the, um, uh, the business of today. Can I just sort of say in introducing this that um, there's been a, a, a public focus on mental health services before COVID-19 and legitimate public concerns about access and, and appropriate mental health services and, and appropriate funding. Um, and it's obvious from the papers today and from the responses we've had from stakeholders and to us as, as frontline councillors that COVID's had a profound impact on consequences for mental health community. So on mental health as well as physical health. So, and, and actually today we say uh, there was a, in the Guardian today, I don't know if anybody saw it, the latest ONS survey, which suggests that the number of people suffering from depressions almost doubled. So today we've got a good opportunity to ensure that our services and levels of investment are up to this challenge. 
So I'm looking forward to it. I've got lots of questions, I know you will too. So who's going to um, start off introducing this? Is it you, Steve, that's going to start off? We'll have a brief introduction and then we'll move over on to, um, to questions and potentially discussion. Is it you that's going to start, Steve? Thank you very much. Yeah, if that's okay, Kate, I'll introduce the, the first Thank paper you. and then the trust will, will come in later in the agenda, as I understand. Yeah. So again, thanks for the invite. Uh, can I just check that everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, as I said, my name is Steve Thomas. I'm a GP locally, sort of, but I'm a clinical director at the CCG as well. And uh, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss some of the significant and substantial work that's been uh, done in the mental health sector, as you've just rightly highlighted, uh, Kate, in, uh, in during COVID and indeed pre-COVID as well, within the uh, the context of uh, of usual and ongoing work. Um, I'm going to take about two minutes, if that's okay, to introduce the paper, but colleagues, um, I understand that you've received the paper, I don't intend to talk through it specifically, but I want to highlight a couple of key element, elements. Uh, Kate, you've already uh, stated quite clearly that COVID, although ostensibly a virus that uh, impacts the the respiratory tract, um, it is also multi-system sort of uh, in its nature, and it's also neurotoxic, as we've been sort of by um, hearing um, more recently as, as things have evolved uh, through sort of uh, the, the analysis of the, the illness itself. But mental health and mental non-well-being has both been directly and indirectly affected as a result of COVID. So we know sort of like the impacts on people's mood, um, common mental illness such as anxiety and depression, the consequences of loneliness um, and isolation, um, and the impact that COVID and the effects of COVID have had uh, are, are quite apparent. But it's also apparent that we've seen sort of very clearly increasing quite substantial and significant first episode of mental illness. So for example, the first episode of psychosis and the exacerbation of existing substantial mental, long-term mental ill health problems that people have been living with. Um, the wider determinants are, are also sort of uh, increasingly apparent. The impact on, on um, losing one's job, unemployment, worklessness, debt and financial consequences, um, and then the knock-on effects with housing. Um, interestingly, sort of gambling, sort of an addictive behaviours have also sort of uh, become more, uh, more, more apparent. And that's, uh, it's also very clear sort of the impact on bereavement. But there's also wider elements, um, as the paper alludes to, but I appreciate that we're ostensibly sort of looking at the impact on the adult population today. But it would be remiss on me, sort of, uh, of, of me to not recognise the impact on our children and young people, the consequences of not being in school, and also more, more, more widely, sort of the experience of adverse childhood experiences, the increase in domestic violence, and the impact on our BAME communities as well. Um, colleagues will be aware, sort of, that the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, have uh, asked for a set of rapid impact assessments to be done, and they are about to be published over the next sort of number of weeks. And they have, uh, are looking at the consequences of poverty and the consequences of ACEs as well. Um, there have been some reported benefits of COVID and the consequences of lockdown, but actually those reported benefits seem to be more specifically sort of for people with existing resources and that are not affected sort of by inequalities. So family time, sort of the, the use of outdoor space, the, the maybe the, the, the opportunities to sort of remain in stable employment, but not be commu commuting, the, the op opportunities of exercise, for example. But COVID itself has been sort of the great revealer and confirmer of inequalities that exist in our, in our system. So very briefly, in the last couple of moments of this introduction, I just want to draw our attention to some of the things that have been done um, and the work that has been happening sort of cross-organizationally. So not only within the context of the NHS, 
for what the local authorities sort of responsibilities have been, um, the, the use of uh, uh, and the work, the, the huge input that our voluntary community sector sort of uh, have also um, uh, contributed to. So, for example, a children and young people's helpline sort of has been established. The adult single point of access was uh, was was consolidated. A staff and professionals helpline sort of was established, and the work of the Sheffield Psychology Board should be particularly noted, uh, working sort of really closely with Sheffield Flourish and the VCSE, sort of to develop a suite of resources that look at staff well-being, frontline staff, care homes and care workers. I have to move to sort of entirely online and notwithstanding the issues of digital poverty, and I'm sure we'll talk about that sort of uh, uh, during our time together, online sort of opportunities were made available. Um, bereavement support services are being consolidated through listening year. And the launch of the primary care mental health service happened in the middle of COVID. And this has been six weeks in, uh, uh, since it's launched. And in these first six weeks, 200 people who neither would have been, um, uh, would have been too complex for IAPT services, not quite complex enough for moving into secondary care services, have been seen and interventions been made. And of those 200 people, 40% have been from BAME community groups. I appreciate that we're looking specifically at mental health, but again, it would be remiss of me not to mention the work that's been done in a cross-organizational way with dementia support as well. And particularly sort of like for, for those uh, families with uh, living with uh, people who live with dementia syndrome, who didn't really fall into um, shielding categories have been supported and helped through this period of time. That's a quick snapshot of what the paper sort of was highlighting and I'll stop there, Chair, if that's okay. Sorry about that, I'm not listening to my, uh, I'm saying it to everybody else, but not doing it myself. But thank you very much for that. That was a really whistle-stop um, introduction. We've also included in your pack today some comments that, and observations that, that we've had from other stakeholder groups, because we feel it's really important to, uh, to take a wide perspective on this. And also, the, you know, to recognise some of the good stuff that's happened as well as the, um, you know, the stuff that hasn't gone so well, so that we can learn and move on. Uh, so I've got, so can I have an indication? I've had two indi indications already, Adam and Jane. Anybody else uh, want to let me know that they want to? to... Okay, so we'll start with um, Jane, Councillor Dunn, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was, I found the paper really interesting, by the way. Um, you touched on two areas that I've made notes from from there, and one of them is domestic violence, but it links with, ha you know, with housing. Um, have we seen an increase in Sheffield of domestic violence cases? Because we know nationally that there is. So if you could just, you know, if you could answer that bit first, and then I'll follow up afterwards, if that's okay, Chair, is that okay? Of course, Karen. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Jane. Um, mm. Specifically, sort of, it's not within my my particular yeah. remit. I haven't got the data mm. to hand. I mm. don't know whether or not Sam sort of will I know specifically one, through DAX. But yes, you know, oh, it, yeah. there has been an increase, and there's been an increase in sort of self referral of perpetrators as well. Um, but Sam, I'll defer to you. So, yeah, that's helpful, Steve. Thank you. And that's a really useful question, Jane. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, obviously, the council's the, the commissioner of the domestic abuse services, so that falls within my remit. Um, I, thought, I suppose it's fair to say that the data on, the hard data on all that at the moment is a, isn't quite as clear about there being a big increase. I think we're all expecting there to be an increase, and, we're, and we, we assume that there has been an increase in domestic violence, but that it's been a bit hidden under while we've been under lockdown. I think that's the challenge we've had as a as a whole system. So the numbers of referrals for help haven't gone up massively. And indeed, they dropped when lockdown started, which on reflection, that's happened across a lot of support services. So as people stopped turning up at A&E, uh, kids weren't going to school, people stopped going to their GP, the traditional places where they would go and 
get identified and seek help uh, sort of dropped away. So the, the sort of initial referrals went down. They're now back up to uh, just around or above pre-lockdown levels in Sheffield. Nationally, there's been some reports in the media about um, national helplines having massive increases in calls. What that doesn't appear to have done is translate into people as accessing help at local areas. That's not just in Sheffield, that's everywhere. So it's a really interesting um, kind of position we're in at the moment where we, we think there's a lot of stuff going on out there. And the police has certainly been picking up more calls lately. But at the moment, it's not translated into a, uh, a flood of um, ask requests for help. We have had more people going into refuges and into accommodation, though. So um, the data is a little bit, I think, is playing catch up with what we think is really going on. And we certainly um, we're anticipating having to provide a lot more support to um, victims. And as Steve said, the, what has been interesting is our perpetrator programmes that we invest in, um, because obviously an important part of the domestic abuse strategy is to stop people committing the crimes as well as helping victims, um, have seen some big increases in self-referrals, uh, where people who have been obviously in a lockdown situation have, have seen that as an opportunity to uh, identify that they have a problem and to get help with it. Uh, and that's been really, really interesting because I don't think it's anything that we, we saw as an outcome of all of this. Uh, but that's been an interesting um, outcome. Also. Thank you for that. Thanks for that, Sam. Just to say, Jane, that, you yeah. know, I know that one of the other scrutiny committees is going to be looking at this in, in quite a lot of detail. Okay, I won't. No, no, no. But obviously there are overlaps, so feel free to pursue it. But I just wanted to... Yeah, it was just yeah. because, obviously, yeah. uh, I've been having quite a lot of emails with people that are struggling and the health, the mental health of you know is escalating as you said it's like they, they've been cooped up and it's the effect on children so really it was about I'm pl you know that we are reflecting nationally but how are we planning for this as we become in and out of lockdown and as services open and schools go back what are we doing to work together on that because I think this is about really then what are we going to learn to put in place in case we repeat this procedure again because yeah Okay, yep. so that's that's about you know um, resilience. Yeah, moving and resilience and moving on. Yeah, okay, because well, most people would expect that that's not the um, this is not the end of COVID. It's going to be with us for a while. Yeah. So, who would like to pick up on that? So one of the one one of the things particularly, James, with uh, moving back to school readiness in the next few weeks mm -hmm. is that the Shepherd Psychology Board been working sort of together with uh, the uh, the children's hospital and the schools programs to sort of bolster that that support and that mental health and well-being support into schools because that has been one of the one of the areas whereby we've seen that decrease in activity because there haven't been eyes on you know sort of teachers haven't been seeing sort of like stuff manifesting itself and happening in the school's environment and so we ha have been planning and preparing sort of uh, for, for that um, and working sort of with schools and teachers as well. Thank you Steve. Um, okay Jane, is there anything else that you want to follow up on that? No, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. Um, okay, can I just add something to that? Oh sorry Heather, you did sorry. indicate, sorry. Sorry, Sorry um, carry on. And I'll bring Sam in because Sam's doing a specific piece of work on this. But um, I think just to, to sort of capitalise on what Steve was just saying about that suppressed demand, of course, children haven't been at school. We um, extended um, an online resource and an online counselling resource uh, at the start of COVID that would have been due to come to its end of its contract, just to give some stability over this, this period of COVID. Um, we also set up the 24 hour, hour helpline. Now, interestingly, that had very, very few calls. I'm talking about half a dozen. Uh, and it was a, a very well publicized health helpline that is starting to increase slowly. And so that suppressed demand that Steve talked about starting to come through. And as Steve said, when we get back into the school environment, what usually happens in the first term or two terms of school, the referrals to CAM start to get up as first of all teachers have got eyes on and identify mental health conditions or indeed as children are under situations that may add them additional stresses the pressure of academia and also bullying and other 
uh, social pressures. So we're expecting that that demand will start to really increase, but we are trying to maintain some of the investments into both the helpline for children, but also the um, online resource that we've talked about and the Door 43 resource. Uh, but Sam's actually got a group about to start next week, so I'll defer then to Sam's piece of work that we're doing about preparing for um, return to school. Sam, Sam you, you know that um, uh, the Children's Scrutiny Committee is going to be looking at this in more detail, but if there's anything that you think that our members would, would be interested in, be helpful to, to sort of briefly summarise that? Okay, yep, yeah, that's fine. So, uh, yeah, so in, uh, I, in anticipation of the, the sort of school return and there being a, the, the kind of pressure on emotional health wellbeing, so we've we've um, been working across the whole system really so we've had a really good engagement from both the clinicians in the cam service uh, family support services in terms of masks school representatives to um, to prepare the kind of return to school offer uh, in, around emotional health well-being which is shaping up now and there's some new resources coming out from the dfe just this week as well in terms of training and support for schools which we've got to incorporate into that but broadly speaking we will have an offer for schools and children and families through the school environment, which is uh, about getting advice. So how to make the, how to help make that school a uh, an emotionally healthy environment, and what can because the, essentially the school is a really should be a very protective environment, able to welcome kids back. There's all the other things schools are going to have to do about infection control and bubbles and all that kind of thing and as part of that it's really important that they're thinking about how that impacts on the well-being of pupils which schools do an awful lot of good great stuff on anyway but so we're going to be supporting them with that with materials and training and advice uh, and then there is an uh, a, a get help offer as well which is where you've got where you need some help in school for a particular pupil may not be a huge amount of input but just some advice and information or someone to talk to um, and then obviously the looking at what we need in terms of the formal offer in terms of CAMs for, for families and children that need a therapeutic intervention. So a whole suite of stuff that will be in place, um, if not right by the very start of the school year, because I think schools will be very much focused on just getting kids in and organising them and helping them move around buildings safely. Uh, but at least by the end of September into that up first bit of the autumn term, we'll have a, a, a sort of suite of stuff as an offer for schools to support health and wellbeing and emotional health of pupils. Sorry, Kate, you're on mute we now. We can't hear you, Kate. See, I'll, I'll just say I'm just sort of keen to move on a bit now because, you know, we want to focus a bit more on adult services as well. And there's going to be a whole session on the children's stuff. So is there anything else that you'd want to add which isn't about children's services at this point? No, OK, sorry, OK. Um, I've got um, Sue Austin. From me as well. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I'll take you after, Sue. Sorry, Adam. Yeah, you, yes. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I've actually got a couple of questions from the report. Um, the, the first thing was I noticed on the section around uh, the homeless that obviously it's en it seems to have enabled some good work to be done to support some people who are homeless. And I just wondered how this is going to work sort of as the extra support starts to go away and whether we're going to be able to keep up work with that group of people who are obviously incredibly vulnerable. And then my second question, which is sort of not directly related to that, is actually about people who were in receipt of quite intensive um, support prior to COVID. So people who were attending group sessions, who needed regular community uh, mental health nurse visits, for example and how their care has been affected because I have had some issues raised with me through uh, sort of casework so I just wondered how that's how those people are being supported when they're so you know isolated. Okay could I suggest that Sam takes the first part of that question and that maybe Mike sort of by um, comes in sort of from the care trust perspective uh, about the uh, about the second part. Okay, thank you, Steve. Sam, please. Yeah, I will do. So it's, it's my show at the moment, isn't it? And then I'll be quiet for a little while. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you're right, Sue. That in terms of the um, so that that initiative, which was sort of prompted by government, which was the Everybody In initiative, which was to get people off the streets and into temporary accommodation, which has been sort of combination of 
reworked student accommodation in the city and and hotels uh, has been you know pretty successful actually in uh, in getting people in off the streets and um and then able to have some interventions offered to them that which has been a lot more difficult when they've been transient and not living in a particular place uh, that's not to say that everybody has stayed where they've uh, been offered in terms of a hotel place some people just haven't managed that and, and, and have sort of drifted back into hanging around the city centre and all that, and that kind of thing but uh, there have been some really good successes um, and I think there's been recognition from government and us locally to, I'm involved in the rough sleepers planning cell which has been set up in terms of the COVID response we sort of recognise that there you know it's not just a question of a temporary fix and then close hotels and everybody goes back on the streets we need to make sure we're building on the partnerships that we've developed through the work that we've done so there are a number of services who've come together who did used to work together but they've worked together a lot more intensively now and know each other a lot better and have come up with solutions to things whether it's delivering prescribed medication to people in a hotel or supervised consumption of things like methadone uh, which obviously you couldn't do by going into a pharmacy some of those um, processes which initially people say oh we can't possibly do that but actually you find that when there's a where there's a will there's a way and you can do it and sometimes you can do it quite quickly when you have to um, so those kind of learning experiences have been really helpful. For government, for example, through Public Health England, um, are uh, putting out some additional resources to help us sustain some of that response uh, into the next year. Uh, so there's some money coming through around substance misuse outreach to enable us to keep doing some of that stuff with the people who are all over the city now in various locations rather than all in the city centre. So I think there's... Um, there's definitely a will and there is some resources following the kind of the desire to sort of sustain some of that work with those people who've got, been brought in off the streets and to and to not just leave them there where they are if the idea is to move them on not too quickly but into because some people are ready are starting to get ready to move into something that's a more of a supported living environment or they're or an own tenancy with support so a number of options uh, that are being looked at to sort of maintain that support can i just on on Sue's point the mental health, uh, the mental health, sorry, the specialist homeless mental health team was that in place before, or is this a new development? It was in place before. It was there before. I just, yeah. I just wanted, wanted to check, and um, and I had a question which was similar to Sue's about the extent to which some of this stuff was going to be temporary or not. So obviously, some of it it will be temporary, but we want to learn from good practice. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to uh, come back on that at all, Sue, or do you want to move on to the next question? Uh, no, I'm just glad to hear that it will be yeah. ongoing and that people have learned from it. That's great, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Then who's going to answer? Uh, I'll, I'll come in now, if, if I may. Hi, I'm Mike Hunter. I'm Medical Director at Shepherd Health and Social... Uh, oh, sorry, Mike. We didn't inter uh, introduce uh, you because... because, because next week, my chief <laughs> executive. So uh, apologies right. for that then. Oh, right. yeah. 2.5 metres away from my chief executive. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I'd just like to, I'd like to add a little to the homeless question, which is to say that our own specialist homeless assessment and support team has, has been working throughout the crisis. And my colleague, Professor Tim Kendall, who's one of our consultant psychiatrists and will be known to many as the National Clinical Director for Mental Health in the NHS, is seeing homeless people face to face and was doing as recently as last Friday I spoke with him about some of the patients that he's been seeing so that that's a long established service and it continues to thrive and offer a, a good uh, standard of care. The, uh, I'll, I'll move on to the, the more general point about what's happened while it's been more difficult to see people uh, face to face. The, the first thing I want to say is that we've had absolutely no complete standing down of face-to-face -face care in, in our services because that just hasn't been, uh, wouldn't have been the right thing uh, to do. All of the decisions about whether to see people face-to-face -face or not have been based on an assessment of the whole of the situation. So for example, where we've had to carry out mental health act assessments, there have been circumstances when that's been two doctors and an approved mental health professional uh, wearing full uh, personal protective uh, equipment and making sure that people got the assessments they needed at the time that they did. We have used telephone consultations uh, more frequently during the crisis but for obvious reasons. Uh, we've seen that many of our services, uh, community-based services, have had a decrease in face-to-face -face contact which you'd ex expect 
but a corresponding increase in face-to-face -face contact. For example, our early intervention in psychosis service, whilst there were fewer face-to-face -face contacts, the telephone contacts that replaced them were actually greater in number, so there was more contact going on uh, within that service. Having said all of that, of course, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a consultant psychiatrist by my own professional background. It would be disingenuous to suggest that not seeing people as frequently face to face in the context of the, you know, the, the, the changes we've had to make during a, a pandemic, that it would be disingenuous to say that there couldn't be any downsides to that because to see another human being, especially at those times of most distress and greatest need, it is you know, the fundamentally therapeutic thing that we do. So as we move now into what's in the NHS refers to the, the phase three of COVID, something that we are doing now is undertaking a review of everyone on our community mental health team uh, caseloads uh, to see how they are, to check what the impact of COVID may have been and to make sure that we're able to put in measures uh, that, that uh, where needed to provide people the, uh, the help that they need now after this period of uh, of a different way of providing the care that we do. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I guess that will be a, a great reassurance to um, to a number of us here, because that was going to be one of my questions as well. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, did you want to come back on that, Sue? Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, Adam, it's you next. Not hey, hi, um, I, yeah, it was just a quick one then. It might sound a bit of a strange one, but uh, in some of the local stuff I've been doing, one of the things um, we've noticed is some of, some, some of the big complaints we're getting is increased antisocial behaviour. But a lot of that is actually connected with um, so a lot of drug dealing and drug abuse seems to be spreading into areas where it hadn't previously been a problem. And I know that I was minded to go back to quite a number of years ago when I was still at work which is the problems that, um, particularly if you've got young people with not a lot to do, you will A, get more drug usage, and then those who are not in work will tend to be more likely to go on and develop problems with their drug usage. And given that COVID is disproportionately affecting younger people economically in terms of the number of them who are losing jobs, who've got irregular income, I was just wondering, have we even, is it even on the radar yet as to the possible link between some socioeconomic effects of COVID on employment and those at the bottom? Well, you know what I'm talking about. And we also know that if you, you have an uncontrolled drug habit, the implications for mental health are quite horrendous. And I think somebody mentioned, I think it's Kate actually, COVID is likely to be with us for a number of years. I don't think we've started to see the proper social effects of it yet. So I was just wondering what your comments would be on that. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Who would like to respond to that? Um, Who would like to respond to that, please? I'd probably be coming on to that one, Chair, and, and then maybe colleagues will as well. But uh, the absolutely, Adam, couldn't agree more. What what we've seen throughout all of this is that COVID is an amplifier and a magnifier on everything that we know already about the wider determinants of health, the societal uh, determinants of, of health. The, the, the NHS implementation plan for getting through the next phase, the, the thing that runs through it like a stick of rock, and it refers to every single action, more, more, more or less, is that everything that we're doing has to be able to measure and modify to take into account the effects of COVID on the most disadvantaged groups and also including uh, Black, Asian, minority ethnic uh, groups, be, be it in perinatal services, be it in improving access to psychological services or what you might call the mainstream core secondary uh, mental health care uh, services. The, the particular point about substance misuse, uh, the, the evidence isn't really out there yet. The evidence for alcohol most definitely is out there yet and that al al people have been using much more alcohol during COVID. I think speaking as a clinician, it would be astonishing if that didn't translate into an equivalent effect in substance misuse. So clearly the, the, the planning of the impact of that is something that we are 
keen to further develop the conversation with the local authority, with yourselves as the commissioners of the uh, Drug and Alcohol Services in Sheffield, to make sure that we've got the most resilient setup possible uh, as, as these you know, uncertain times uh, emerge and develop. Okay, thank you. Adam, did you want to come back on that at all? Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I've got um, Sean in next, Councillor Maya Richards. I haven't because uh, Sue did my questions. Thank you, Sue. Okay. Um, can I just apologise to uh, Councillor Abdul Kayoun? You're on my second page. It's the first time I've had a second page on this big screen for uh, Councillor Abdul, uh, Abdul Kayoun still is present today as well. Um, any further qu questions? I I've got some questions. So, oh, Councillor Steve Ayres. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, questions on two, two different separate areas. Firstly, um, on the um, on some of the comments that um, Mike was saying regarding the wider determinants of health, um, I'm just wondering whether there's there's any evidence been gathered as to the crossover. I just wanted to explore the crossover between um, physical health um, and um, the impacts of, of COVID on on physical health. As a crossover with mental health, I was quite interested that that uh, Jan, you, you you put in um, your last um, staff bulletin, um, you talked about the East Eating Disorders Service, and I thought that was interesting uh, as an example of how um, COVID has presented uh, particular difficulties in 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 delivering the eating disorders or in getting the message across. I think you said. Um, to to people that that um, suffer from um, eating disorders, and I'm just wondering, in terms of the general public in the um, in the aftermath of uh, lockdown, um, whether issues like that, whether there's been any evidence of the not only the the, the medical, uh, sorry, not only the mental health impacts of COVID. The crossover, how that has uh, has gone on to um, affecting pe people's physical health. That's my first question. The second question was um, uh, related to um, um, care homes with people suffering from um, dementia, and um, I, I did ask, and you did circulate. Thank you, Chair. Um, the um, briefing from the Alzheimer's Society. I'm just I'm not quite who, who, who would respond to this, but I'm just wondering um, how are we um, with along with part how is the council along with partners um, coping with um, the, the increase in or trying to um, return back to some kind of a normal in terms of visits. Um, by uh, relatives or, or whatever to um, people that suffer from dementia um, uh, in uh, dementia care homes. So two separate points there, I think. So who would like to start on that, Steve, please? Yep, um, <laughs> thanks for the, for, for the question. Um, they're, they're both really um, very pertinent, clearly, sort of, uh, and prescient. From the physical health perspective, uh, we know, sort of, uh, um, because we know historically that about 30% of people who live with a physical health long term condition have a primary mental health problem, and about 40% of people with a primary mental health problem live with a long term physical health uh, condition. So that's population wide, and there is no doubt that COVID, as a multi system sort of disease, will be sort of affecting sort of uh, the um you know sort of the, the 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 experience that individuals will have do we know yet um what the what the even the medium sort of to longer term consequences are no i don't think that we do there's so much research that is ongoing and will need to be done but um, but we know that uh, there, there are going to be sort of late effects and we know that we're whole human beings. So therefore, a purely biomedical model is never going to cut the mustard 
it's going to have to be sort of holistic, psychosocial, sort of in its nature. So we need to be prepared for that, knowing what we already know about how people who live with long-term conditions have men, uh, can have primary mental health problems. And if you live with the primary mental health problems, your risk of living with other sort of long-term conditions such as diabetes or respiratory disease. Um, I mentioned in my, in, my, uh, in, in my brief introduction that there are emerging issues like neuropsychiatric issues. So, you know, brain inflammation sort of aspects of things that longer term consequences. So we need to be set up for that. Now, one of the things that we are doing as a system cross organizationally uh, is that there are the post COVID sort of pathways being developed um, and the teaching hospital and the care trust and general practice and the voluntary sector sort of are being part of developing those pathways. So what we don't want to see in our system is, for example, somebody who may have been primarily noted to have sort of the respiratory effects of COVID just going through follow up with respiratory doctors at the teaching hospitals. Um, that's not going to be helpful. It's about a multidisciplinary approach. So psychologists and mental health support are going to be sort of part of that. Does that answer the first part of the question reasonably? Or do other colleagues want to come in? Are you happy with that, Steve? Yes, thank you. So who would like to the care homes bit? Who wants to, oh, Heather, was you, did you want to pick up on that? Um, not specifically the care homes bit, but um, I guess just referring back to the work of the Sheffield Psychology Board, um, what the, the Psychology Board is trying to do is work across sectors and into areas that perhaps previously they might not have been commissioned to work into, that we've been working at a really good collaborative system level. And one of the offers that's happened is into the care homes to help to support staff. And, and it's something that perhaps we've not touched upon much today, but one of the biggest um, issues that's emerging, and certainly that came out of the Greater Manchester Resilience Hub work, which is the post-Manchester Arena bomb bombing, is they're talking about a psychos what they're calling a psychosocial tale. So we fix the people that were immediately impacted by, either physically or mentally by the, the, the blast, i.e. people that were part of, of that terrorist attack but actually what they're now noticing is three years later the staff that have been there stepping up to support those people themselves are beginning to either need to retire on ill health grounds early or themselves developing uh, suicidal ideation whereby we're actually recognizing that the pressure that staff have been put under in this system is is quite a long-term impact so I think um, I just wanted to almost take us back to the very start of the paper and, uh, and the questions that have kind of been spawned from that is we are predicting a big demand. We don't know exactly how much. Nationally, we're being told 20 to 40 percent. Um, we know that that's going to be across all ages, across all groups. And as Steve outlined, there's going to be some groups most impacted. We need to be thinking about staff. We need to be thinking about the uh, impacts of long-term unemployment. If um, certainly the national suicide um, guru, Professor Appleby, is talking about um, a risk that might even uh, uh, sort of present up to four years later, around after the, the last financial crash in 2008, that the employment consequences and the increase in suicide um, ideation was was kind of a four-year lag. So we're thinking about this being a very long term. Um, and whilst we are um, doing what we can with the resources we've got and planning against the long term plan, I think there's been fair challenge and that should carry on uh, to be challenged to Department of Health and NHS England. And that is we can build Nightingale hospitals uh, for the physical impacts of COVID, but we haven't seen a similar sort of increase in the capacity and the resources that are going to be made available around mental health. So whilst we are, as a CCG with our local authority partners, going back to our original long-term plans, and that's to invest in crisis services, in IAPT, in children and young people services, that is the demand that we were already struggling with. I think you referred to right at the start, Kate, the demand we're already struggling with in the city that is increasing. 
with COVID, this is, we're getting into a whole new uh, territory. And so I just wanted to sort of, if you like, reframe our thinking around uh, the big picture as well as some of the specifics. Uh, with regards to dementia, we have been doing some specific outreach work and I know that my uh, continuing health colleagues have been beginning to start to look at how they put back in those face-to-face -face visits and also have been looking at on an individual basis um, those visits for families to be able to start to make into those settings but perhaps uh, other colleagues might go into more detail there. But I just wanted to kind of step back and sort of say there's a lot that we've done, there's a lot more we need to do but by good my goodness um, we have got a tsunami coming towards us and, and we're aware of that but the the resources don't seem to be nationally yet matching that. Steve, could you unmute, please? Um, sorry, you won't be able to show the diagram because you've not got control of the screen. Only the, okay. um, the host can do that, sorry. Okay. Um, did you okay. want to May comment? Yes, may I just add, uh, just very specifically, sort of one of the things that has been um, uh, that has come out of the digital revolution that COVID has brought us, like we're experiencing today, so the use of Zoom and MS Teams, um, a, a platform, an educational platform sort of, uh, called ECHO has been used with our care homes. And interestingly, sort of, uh, that's been really led very, very well sort of by St. Luke's, not purely sort of from an end of life care perspective, but they have championed this methodology sort of as an educational platform and a tool to sort of disseminate information and skills. And, um, and uh, the care homes have been sort of like really on board with, uh, with this. So issues around sort of like the use of personal protective equipment, how to sort of uh, uh, skills about how to deal with social distancing in challenging environments where you have uh, people living with dementia syndrome that will find it hard to social distance, behavioral support, end of life care per se. And one of the packages of, uh, of support has been about how to sort of uh, uh, reintegrate um, visits and families visiting and uh, the care homes have been have started to be supported with that type of uh, of intervention and that's been supported by the memory service so what well, the lead consultant psychiatrist has been involved uh, has been involved with that as have psychologists from the psychology board so that type of package of care sort of as, a, as an example as an educational sort of uh, package has been something that's been uh, delivered through this type of platform Thank you, Steve. That's that's very reassuring. Um, can I just say before I bring George in? I know George, you've indicated you want to say something. Um, on a so on a different matter, um, uh, Emily and I attended. Well, I've, we've been a couple of times actually to talk to the care homes, and they're not always fully aware of the um, the training and so on that's available. So um, it was partly a question and partly a request to make sure that that um, that all the care homes are are. Um, uh, aware of and encouraged actually to access um, uh, uh, these platforms because certainly uh, when we went to talk it was about the continents review wasn't it that that they weren't always aware of of, of what was available to them and and they hadn't been reminded of that for a period of time so um we are all concerned about this obviously because there have been quite heartbreaking stories in the press recently haven't there about some homes that that, that weren't um uh, homes taking different different approaches to allowing relatives to um, connect with with their um, loved ones and so on. So that that isn't the answer, but it's part of an answer. So there's just a point around when something is available, actually making sure that um, that, that that homes know about it. And possibly I don't know if that's integrated with the um, uh, maybe maybe John will know about that. The you know we have the the um, Social care actually has a has a um, uh, and um, newsletters and stuff like that going out to to all the the homes so to make sure that 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 um, they're aware of of, of that because it's obviously an issue of public concern. Yeah. So sorry about that. That was just a comment really, and and I agree with Steve, and I think we all would that it's it's you know a real thing about you know um, it's, it's very human, isn't it? Um, and and it, 
and, and we all want to make sure people can be yeah, spend as much time together as they can. George, did you want to come in on the, on, on the series of questions and, and unmute yourself, please? It would help. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now, Chair? Yes. Um, so um, I just want to say briefly, it's a, it's a, it's a, some of the points I would make have been um, taken up by other people wouldn't be helpful, but it, it's clear that in the last sort of, I'd say within, within the last month, um, Greg Bell has obviously issued his guidance to um, two care homes around visiting. Um, but it, it met, um, and I do think that the, the, mo the most sensitive area around visiting certainly is around um, the most vulnerable people, perhaps often with de dementia, who um, there's a particularly um, sensitive area around, you know, people obviously, I've uh, had plenty of people come to me saying, you know, perhaps not a lot more time to see relatives. And, and I think the council is really aware of that. Um, the guidance itself, and, and, I, and I'm sure we can circulate this to the um, to the committee if you haven't seen it, doesn't um, you know? It doesn't it, it it makes sure that homes have to take um, a very strong role in setting out the kind of arrangements that they have and um, the extent to which um, visits can be um, facilitated, and that is. From, um, from, 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 from my view, the only really practical way of doing things because um, we have to remember that um, homes are still being, as we would expect them to be, incredibly vigilant around their individual circumstances um, that, um, to the extent they can allow visiting, including potentially where it is, um, um, where, 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 where it is deemed safe and necessary, including some physical contacts. Um, but there are times where um, there has been clearly a clash, and we've seen that um, a case in the paper, um, between um, the wishes of, of a resident, in some cases, in this case particularly actually supported by um, professionals at the council, and the legitimate um, concerns of a home um, who have not only that resident, but a wider set of residents um, and, their, and, their, and their safety con to consider. Um, I think, unfortunately, we're not going to see an easy resolution to this um, with the time. But what I can say is that actually a huge amount of time effort from Sheffield City Council staff um, and no doubt such our staff in the, in the CCDs and, and within homes has gone into um, trying to build sensitive relationships. So as far as possible, where, um, um, where visits can take place, they are and they take place in a way which is both sensitive and trying to meet the needs um, of both that resident and that family, but also the wider resident and family within any, any, any particular home. Yeah. Thank you, George. Um, I've, got, I've got a couple of questions. Um, my first question is about access, access, access. Um, access to mental health services was a problem before um, the pandemic, but as we all know, um, COVID has accelerated a lot of issues and problems as we've discussed and heard illustrated today. Heard illustrated, you know what I mean. Um, so what are we going to do about it basically? What plans do we have in place to ensure that, um, you know, we, we catch up with, with the um, increased demand, but actually ensure that we put in place appropriate arrangements, easier arrangements for people to access services. Do you, who would want to start with that? And I don't think anybody will want that one. <laughs> okay, so Steve, you can start then. Okay, um, I'll, I'll happily start. Sort of, no doubt, uh, Heather and uh, and Mike and Jan sort of will will probably join in at this point as well, because access is at at varying different levels. We we want to have a society whereby. The prevention of, of illness and the promotion of wellness is our is our key sort of uh, indicators of, of quality. So, looking at you know the sorts of resources that are out there, you know we we sort of uh, are so thankful sort of to to the commission services that our VCSE sort of sector so sort of flourish, for example, have done with the mental health guide, you know, sort of in the, in the sorts of resources that are available on that prevention and promotion sort of uh, uh, level as well. 
But in terms of uh, speaking as a general practitioner working sort of like clinically sort of in the city, uh, one of the things that, that's fundamentally important is continued access to general practice. And just as Mike had said quite emphatically sort of that services had not stopped from a, from a secondary care perspective, I want to really strongly reassure you know, colleagues that general practice has definitely not stopped at all. Um, the, the, the methodology of, uh, of, uh, of consultation may have changed and we may now be at around about 70% sort of through telephone, video consultation, but that has not stopped face-to-face -face, uh, uh, happening. So we need to be ongoingly sort of aware of that. The use of the primary care networks, networks of GPs working together. And if colleagues remember sort of right at the beginning, an hour and a bit ago, sort of I, I briefly made mention about the primary care sort of mental health framework. Uh, we are one of 12 trailblazer sites in, sort of, in England. Um, we are now operating sort of in, uh, across 21 general practices, covering approximately 200,000 of our population. Um, and actually, sort of chair, really interestingly, the 200 or so people that have been seen sort of in the last six weeks are people that wouldn't have traditionally or historically sort of accessed mental health services. So it's a, it, that is actually about revealing sort of some of the unmet need. And I think that one of the things that we need to do sort of is to rapidly expand on, on that. Uh, but that's being uh, an NHS England sort of uh, um, uh, perspective. And we turn to, you know, sort of central government for sort of like the adequate resources. Um, I've gone an hour and 12 minutes without saying that 25% of the mortality and morbidity of the NHS, which is mental ill health related, is only supported by approximately 12% of resources. And this is what we as a society have chosen, not us as a CCG or the local authority, sort of, or this is what is resourced for mental health and well-being in our society. Well, I want to see that changed. And one of the ways in which we can see that change is to see frameworks of care, support and treatment, not necessarily about illness mitigation services, but actually that holistic aspect and the investment into children's services and, you know, good starts in life and families sort of uh, so we can combat adverse childhood experiences. So I've just spoken there briefly about um, general sort of like promotional sort of aspects, general practice itself. I apt, um, just like any other service in the, in the city, there was a massive tail off where people locked down and um, withdrew and thought maybe the NHS is closed. We're beginning sort of to see that come back out. We've, uh, we've got to be really clever about the offers, notwithstanding what I mentioned earlier on about digital poverty. We've got to sort of be able to, uh, to, to allow people to access um, services and support in the, in the least restrictive environment. So we need to think cleverly about that. And then moving on to sort of like more, um, more complex services where sort of like there are ill, you know, sort of a substantial and significant illness, particularly crisis. Um, there's, a, there's a whole... Steve, I can't hear you. I don't know if others have, can. Steve. Steve, he's muted himself. <laughs> Steve, we've lost you sound-wise. I don't think he can hear us either. I'll just send a message to him, Chair. Uh, OK, thank you. I think we got most of what he was going to say. Oh, he's, he's muted now. Um, St Steve, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up. Oh, you can. We just missed the last sort of 30 seconds of, of, of what you were saying. If you want to repeat that. Oh. We've got all the passion and, and, and the stuff about... The Sorry, I just, I just tried to summarise by saying I'd spoken about the, maybe the promotion prevention sort yeah. of agenda, the general practice, primary care uh, elements of things, and then moving into sort of more of the crisis elements of things, where the crisis work across adult and children's pathways is being um, invested in 
And, uh, and of course, the hallmark of a good crisis service is that there should be prevention of crisis as the key thing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the issue. And then I sort of just invited Mike to, uh, uh, to, to comment then as well. Okay, so if that's, if, if I- I'll have Mike and, and, and then Heather, I've got you two, go then. Okay, thank you. Yes, I completely agree that the, 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 the really thought through approach to this needs to rely on an expansion of the offer outside of the traditional secondary care model. So most definitely, uh, I am, and as people will know, part of the long-term plan in the NHS is to get close to a million more people seen uh, in IAPS, and that clearly now needs to be focused on the, the COVID uh, impact and effect. Uh, Steve is right that we need to continue to grow the primary care uh, mental health offer. I would, I would argue that as we become more confident in the delivery of a service like that, it will be the case that some people who may have previously received secondary mental health care will receive something closer to home within their own primary care networks and local uh, neighbourhood uh, ne networks. What will, what will not be good in the whole system is if we're not able to respond to the prevention challenge and COVID translates into very large numbers of people with very serious severe mental uh, health problems that would have previously necessitated uh, secondary health care because there is an opportunity for us to do something different here working in the system and really get on top of the prevention agenda. Steve alluded earlier on that uh, public health uh, colleagues in the local authority have led on the production of some rapid impact assessments uh, and, and, and I, I'm absolutely sure that they're going to say that COVID has an effect on physical and mental health which is much worse if you're at an already uh, disadvantaged stage or member of a disadvantaged uh, group so if we're able to focus our effort and resources in that way then we can hopefully not just prevent people from becoming mentally unwell in the first place, which is what we refer to as primary prevention, but we can also prevent people who have become unwell relapsing again or becoming really poorly to the extent that they need secondary care services or even inpatient admission, which is the concept of secondary prevention. Thank you. Heather, I'm quite conscious we've got another few questions and so on, unless you've got something desperate that you want to add, I'd, I'd really like to move on to it. We've got two questions left, you see. Are you okay to do that? It was just a tangible answer in terms of our investment plans, because I think okay. you're actually okay. saying what we're doing. So, uh, so we have to in invest to meet what's called the National Mental Health Minimum Investment Standards. And that's uh, by 2021, we need to add another 5.5% to our spending. So we've got around 4.5 million to spend on mental health services. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we had some pre-commitments to that prior to COVID. What we need to do is review that in the context of COVID and the conversations that we just heard Stephen and Mike outlining. But some of that, just to assure um, councillors, it is across a full range of services that do include, does include IAP, the crisis services, children and young people, and intervention in psychosis services. But I think the, the key thing is that we need to just maybe step back from the pre-COVID plans, we look at the post-COVID plans. And I cannot help but think the voluntary sector is um, a missing, an un not sorry, missing, but an untapped resource that we may need to uh, look to grow uh, in order to meet demand. Because what we do know is the workforce is just not out there for us to be able to recruit into uh, medics and, and nursing roles and psychology roles. So I think we need to be thinking about new workforce solutions too. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, uh, guys, I'll, I will bring you in, but just, while we're on finance, I just want one of my other areas, if I hadn't come up, I was going to ask about, was the impact of the um, additional national funding. Is what you're describing, uh, does that include the additional national funding that's referred to in the, whatever, the long-term plan for mental health yeah, services? That, that is, that's that that, funding, that's, yes, that's, yes. That's, but, but as I was saying earlier, it doesn't uh, actually include, if you like, post-COVID additional funding to meet that surge and that tsunami of demand that we're anticipating. And there's no plans for that at the moment? No, we have no not heard, we've not heard of plans for that at the moment, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I just wanted, while we were on finance, actually, just to, to, to finish that point. I've got Martin and then Sean Ed. Martin Phipps, Councillor Phipps. Thank you, yeah, thank you Kate. 
Um, so my, my concerns, well, it's good to hear that the services are continuing throughout the pandemic, but I, I, share, I share the same concerns as Councillor McDonald um, to do with access, which is always one of my key concerns for mental health care as well. Um, so uh, Sheffield Health Watch have identified a range of issues with the services that are currently being offered via the phone. Uh, it's 4.3 and 4.4 on the report pack. Um, so if, if phone services aren't appropriate for the person who needs help, um, is it obvious how to access alternative services? Are there, is it easy to find them? Is it possible to access a face-to-face -face service if phone services are not appropriate for you? What other services are appropriate? And are actually all people's preferences being recorded? Or is it just if you are at a certain level, you will only be able to access certain types of support? Um, and um, it's good to hear additional um, pick up through the primary health care um, for people that weren't being supported before. That's really encouraging. But do we know how many people who were receiving support pre-COVID um, are no longer receiving support because they, they aren't reaching out now? Thank you. Okay, who would like to take that one? Is... I'll kick off. Okay, thank you. Um, certainly sort of from a general practice point of view, one of the things that we're doing is to, is to uh, offer initial consultations via phone or via video, and then come to sort of like a reason reasonable clinical judgment together with the individual um, uh, about how to proceed and what to do next. Now that might mean sort of, for example, that that individual is, is actually seen physically face to face that same day, you know, sort of, uh, so for example, that's, I, I can say that quite confidently because I've experienced that within my own clinical practice. So, you know, sort of that, that can be sort of the case, but obviously we're still within the context of trying sort of to mitigate the transmission of COVID as a virus per se, sort of, uh, but, personal protective equipment is used. I can sort of say quite categorically that from a, from a primary care mental health perspective, with the primary care mental health workers, the senior sort of practitioners that are working in, in the general practice setting, that yep, they are still seeing sort of people face to face. Mike uh, made mention quite clearly earlier on sort of uh, that similarly things are happening within the, within the care trust and the use of personal protective equipment if necessary as well. Really interestingly, my own experience has been that, that a, a number of people, and again, I've used the word digital poverty several times because we've got to be cognizant of it, but, but for those that I've been sort of uh, involved with, there's been sort of quite a, quite a lot of proactive choice about the use of either telephone or video consultations because there's been sort of like an ease of, uh, of connectivity, not needing to travel, not needing to go wait in a sitting room. But of course, you know, we're talking about a large population, 600,000, and there's got to be sort of uh, options and opportunities to work in sort of in various and different ways. I don't know whether my, uh, again, I know Mike is my other sort of like, Coalface clinical colleague, uh, sort of uh, whether or not you want to say anything, Mark. Yeah, I'll just I'll just say that within our services, we absolutely have not turned off face-to-face uh, -face in interactions and, and, and assessments, and where those are what people need. Absolutely, those are the things that we're, we're, we're providing. You use the word preference. I think it, I, I couldn't go quite that far if you know what I mean, because you can imagine circumstances where somebody's preference wouldn't be compatible with some really important principles around infection control. But wh where it's needed, it's absolutely uh, you know, available and happening. OK, thank you. Charlotte? I'm sorry, Mark. Can I just say, Martin, I'm sorry, I don't think we're going to get an answer to the, for this about access today, and I don't think it's a single uh, issue. And it's one of the things I think I want, we'll want to come back to in terms of our summary and our recommendations and so on. So, um, I, I was going to ask you, are you happy with that? You, you, I'm sure you wouldn't be because I think it's something we need to keep debating and keep the pressure up on. But did you want to come back on, on the answers that you got? I suppose would be my 
<laughs> Sorry, I didn't ask you that. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if people knew the answer to how many people were accessing oh, awesome. uh, services that are now no longer accessing services, not because they no longer need to or no longer have the resource to do so. Can I just answer from um, from secondary services in relation to people that we know? So people who are on people's caseloads who access either crisis services or the longer term services, every service has risk assessed and re-risk assessed their caseloads to see if there's anybody who um, hasn't popped up who should have um, or who um, may require some extra support because pe people's needs have changed through the impact of COVID. We talk less about the disease COVID and more about the impact of lockdown, to be honest, and what that's done to people. So within our secondary services, each service, that's why we knew somebody made reference to eating disorders earlier. That's why we know that so the impact of some of the um, social media pre and press stuff around losing weight um, has had a massive impact on some people of our um, service users and eating disorders, for example. So we have a really good idea of who is, who isn't accessing services. Those that have moved on to telephone or video consultation very comfortably, we also know that there are people who are accessing services better than before because of the different choices they've got for access. Uh, and then there are those that we are still following up to make sure there's not an unmet need. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and if I may add just one other thing from a general practice perspective, I know that general practice colleagues proactively sort of by uh, contacting people on at-risk uh, lists. So for example, you know, we know sort of uh, people who are living with a diagnosis of, uh, of a learning disability or living with severe and enduring mental illness or living with a dementia syndrome. And there is a process by which, you know, sort of general practice is, has been keeping in contact and being sort of proactive about that. That we're moving into a phase now sort of where long-term condition management is, 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 is stepping back up you know, sort of the post-COVID sort of elements of, uh, not that we will be post-COVID, we're peri-COVID and we'll be peri-COVID for, for, for probably several years, uh, no doubt. But if you have an intellectual disability and you're living with a long-term condition such as diabetes, then you are known to your general practitioner and general practice is now proactively starting sort of to re-engage through sort of via telephone, video consultations, and face-to-face -face as necessary, and managing people in that holistic way. Thank you, Steve. We're going to have a separate session on primary care, and I think there's lots of questions for us, and, and we can use this as an illustration about the uh, capacity of primary care to, to, to um, actually exercise, uh, stand up to, to the challenge, actually, so thank you for that. Uh, sorry, Sean, Ed. Not at all. Um, Councillor Maya Richards, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the effects or the impact of COVID on, uh, if there has been, on the mental health of people with, with disabilities. We, we know that the um, people with conditions and there's been people who have had to be shielding as opposed to just being cautious, if you like, and then suddenly at the beginning of August, everybody was all allowed out and shielding was over. And nobody talked about how that felt for those particular people. But I guess also, as I say, disabilities, physical disabilities, which is different again from conditions. Um, what what has, has there been? Has, has there been also an increase in concerns around COVID because of particular disabilities? Thank you. Going to um, respond to that, please. Um, I'll kick off and try, sort of, if that's okay, because I think my first my first response is going to be: I don't think that there's specific data that I've certainly sort of not been aware of about condition specific in 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 the way in which I think you're uh, you're alluding to, Shoned. Um, 
I think that um, that certainly sort of like what I what, what I spoke about earlier, where one lives with maybe one or more long term condition and you may have a, a, a mental health uh, sort of uh, condition as well. And then you may live with a physical or indeed an intellectual disability. We know that even pre-COVID, you take COVID out of that equation and actually sort of like your, your risk of, uh, of increased mortality and dying sort of from preventable physical health conditions is substantially sort of different to that of the general population, sometimes as much as, you know, sort of 15 or 20 years. So, you know, COVID, as I said earlier on, sort of has been the great revealer and confirmer of inequalities. And I think that that's the only thing that I can really say sort of uh, in response, in direct response to your, to your question. That's probably not a satisfactory answer but I'm afraid I don't know specifically. I, I'm, I'm happy to come in on, on the question in, rela in relation specifically to learning disabilities, if that would be helpful. Uh, as, a, as a provider of special secondary care mental health services, we've been watching the impact uh, on the physical health of people with learning disabilities very, very closely. Uh, what, what I would say, and I, I say this in the spirit that the information is constantly changing so I'm, I'm always at risk of saying something that, that subsequently turns out to be not the whole picture but I say I say in good faith what I know to be the case at the, at the minute as things stand amongst the, the people with learning disabilities that are in our specialist secondary services uh, we haven't seen a uh, an, uh, what's the right word a disproportionately large impact on people with learning disabilities although nationally there is a significant concern that that might be the case I'd just like to also bring the committee's attention to the fact that as part of the phase three continuation work for COVID in the NHS, there'll be a requirement that general practitioners review two thirds at least of the patients on their practice lists on their learning disability register uh, in, in the coming year. So there's a, there's, there's a concern of an impact that might not yet have been fully revealed and hence a requirement uh, that GPs, or well, not just GPs, but people in, in, in the world of primary care, see the patients on their learning disability case register, really to, to, to check and establish the, the, the COVID effect. And I can confirm that that is absolutely happening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary. Can I just come back and say that perhaps... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, no, no, okay, it's okay that perhaps we might talk to some of the voluntary organisations around um, physical disability to ask whether they have seen an increase in mental health, anxiety or what have you with, with some of the um, people that they work with. That, that might be something we could do in the future. And also, can I just thank Steve for pronouncing my name so beautifully? <laughs> oh, this is a bit of Welshism going on, isn't it? Bit of the, bit of the Celts. <laughs> um, can, can I just say also, oh, this ONS have just, uh, have just published a survey, Steve, as well, which did actually identify higher levels of depression among certain groups, including people. Absolutely. So, and that, so and that's that, both of those, I think, are relevant. And Sean is. Yes. Point, thank you. And they, they will form part of the rapid impact assessment sort of literature sort of review as well. And just to say sort of by, um, uh, as well and confirm with Sean Ed that, uh, that actually the Mental Health Network, um, whose um, sort of, uh, uh, project manager sort of is Colette Harvey, um, has produced um, a, a, a survey sort of by, over the last number of weeks that has helped to inform the rapid impact, the mental health rapid impact assessment as well. And that has incorporated a variety of, of BCSE third sector sort of organizations, including MIND and MENCAP. Um, um, I'll, I'll check very sort of specifically sort of about uh, a physical disability sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, BCSE providers uh, as well, sort of, uh, but certainly from a mental health learning disability and autistic spectrum uh, condition sort of perspective, we have uh, captured those sorts of uh, data. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time, but I think it's 
you know, obviously because of the amount of interest that we've got in, in this topic, we are actually running quite significantly over time, but that's because it's so interesting. Trish, I've got you, but I'm going to take Gary first, please. Councillor Weatherall. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, it's just, just really, uh, it's a great meeting so far. It's uh, been very interesting. Uh, but Steve, you just, you just mentioned, if you don't mind me picking you out, that everybody else has been speaking so far today, uh, that you mentioned that the, the 12% funding coming in, uh, but you're doing 25% of the work. Can you just clarify that a bit? And I know every organisation would say that they want more money, but are we, um, are we actually fulfilling uh, the mental health needs in Sheffield? What an excellent question. With, uh, oh, and, uh, we've got. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, Probably not. And of course, you know, sort of sp speaking sort of uh, um, uh, bluntly, sort of and honestly, sort of, no, we're not fulfilling sort of like the mental health needs and requirements, even if we look at, uh, you know, the promotion of mental well-being as, as, uh, as well as the earliest intervention, as well as the mitigation of illness, you know, sort of by... The answer would be no, but I don't think that, that that's where unique in that. That's a societal thing. It's a national thing. It's an international thing. You know, it's a, it's the, it's the whole sort of like, and forgive the jargon, but the parity or the disparity of esteem sort of perspective. We make choices as society, as as people sort of around even this table, sort of to say, well, actually, a biomedical model, sort of an approach, purchase this very expensive scanner, sort of like in a you know, sort of in, a, in, in an acute sort of physical health hospital over here, but actually sort of returns on an investment, you know, sort of uh, uh, can, can be sort of substantial and significant with small uh, shifts in, you know, sort of in resources. Um, Heather, sort of I'm going to turn to for a moment, if I may, because I think Heather's got sort of, like she made mention earlier on, because she said quite clearly sort of, that we are sort of as um, uh, cross organizationally sort of because we, we're doing so much together, you know, sort of in Sheffield, uh, the clinical commissioning group representing sort of like the local NHS, the local authority as a commissioner, the provider sort of like so the care trust itself and the voluntary and community sort of uh, and third sector organizations working collaboratively sort of to deliver you know sort of what we can within the envelope that we've got so minimum mental health investment standards according to nhs england are being met are they enough sort of to to actually do what we would like to do and should be doing sort of in sheffield the answer is no but Heather, you might want to expand before I oh, become too controversial. I, I guess I always say um, the clues in the title, it's the minimum mental health investment standard that we have to meet. But the word minimum to me is, is the key one there. Uh, so and nationally, if that is the standard that is set, that is what's the expectation. Um, and it's probably just worth taking a segue into the kind of contracting world. And I won't go too far into this, but every time somebody turns up at the teaching hospital, in normal circumstances prior to COVID, because we're in a, a paused contract at the moment, but uh, basically the teaching hospital get paid for that activity. So if a thousand extra people turn up in a week, we pay a thousand extra worth of activity. Uh, the National Contract for Mental Health Service is on the block. So if a thousand extra people turn up at the, at the care trust, there isn't then automatically that money comes through and that's the national contract. We have to reconcile at the end of the year with the care trust and and as steve says that you know we we don't have enough we don't have that um resource within the city and, and within uh, the country to kind of necessarily then meet that demand and this is why i'm talking about the tsunami that we're predicting we're already struggling in the city to meet demand and that's with all the best efforts and intentions of many different organizations so it is a concern um we have got the plans for that, the investment that we do have nationally, and we, we are actually uh, very successful in sort of bringing down additional pots of money. So the primary care mental health service that Steve talked about earlier, we're one of 12 national implementer sites. Uh, we've been a national implementer site for uh, some of the work around um, work and employment and supporting employment. So we do what we can to bring additional money 
that is released by the Department of Health. Um, but there are waiting times for services. Uh, there are there are there is a big demand, and the demand is getting bigger. So I guess that's probably in summary. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Trish, you've been very patient waiting, waiting to come in, and I do um, I do realise that I've missed out on Angela, Councillor Argencio as well. So those are the two final um, speakers for this session. I'd be Trish. glad to know that yes. mine isn't really a question. It is just perhaps a little bit of a statement in the fact that uh, with, re with re reference to access, um, one group of people were already having terrific trouble contacting practices and hospitals, and that is the deaf people. And COVID has really exacerbated access problems for these patients. And also from learning disabilities problem, there is still confusion and reluctance to, to ask for help. Um, and it's just no need to, to answer. I know you're trying to sort it, but I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. Thank you, Trish. Um, Angela, Councillor Argencio. Sorry, I missed you. I've been flicking between two screens. It's, it's OK. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Trish, for that. And I am going to highlight um, another group of people who are finding some, uh, not just COVID um, having an impact on the mental health, but also some of the measures put in place to uh, mitigate COVID, which is the social distances and visually impaired people are finding it harder to go out because uh, people have been always been very independent and being able to go out with their dogs or using the stick they can't social distance uh, and that is having a huge impact on them and people are feeling trapped in their own houses um, so uh, this is also going to um, you know put more pressure on services uh, so it's something that we need to really to also look at thank you I'm taking that as a comment is that is that how you meant it yeah yes thank you yeah okay that's fine. Now, unless, it, unless there's anybody else who hasn't um, asked a question and wants to do so, uh, please indicate now. Otherwise, I'm going to sort of try to sum up a bit, <laughs> which is quite difficult because it's been really, really um, wide ranging. And I have a cunning plan, though. I have a cunning plan. So um, right back to the beginning, then. This is a theme that's come up in one of our earlier sessions. That, that we want to see that the good practice that's been identified in the learning is actually formally captured and built upon. That was a point we made at the our first session as well. So um, it's good that there has been um, uh, positive um, developments and, and uh, but we're, this committee wants to see those actually captured and so that we can build on those. Um, we want to see evidence of improved access Everybody's highlighted the um, the barriers at the moment, um, and everybody acknowledges that we need to try and do something about it. But I think there's a need to actually try and find some way of assessing and, and demonstrating that we, we can improve access to mental health services. There's a big issue around funding, obviously, and that we, we do acknowledge that the situation beforehand was uh, was far from adequate and that we um, appreciate uh, that, that locally we're going to find it really difficult to, um, to fund the increased demand which is going to have been um, uh, created, well it's not been created but it's going to have been exacerbated by, by Covid. So we really, I mean obviously we would call upon, upon national government to make appropriate financial arrangements to do that. Um, the, the other issue that's bobbed up and down and has come up in other um, sessions as well is the increased significance of digital solutions. Some of those are excellent, but they also um, highlight the impact of digital exclusion. And we do think as a city that we're going to have to do something about that. So I think that's not necessarily simply for this committee or simply for one agency to do that. But I think we're going to have to um, try to do something about that. Uh, and, and finally, there's, there's, we need to make some improvement in meeting mental health needs. I can't, I'm not actually articulating that very well, but it's come up on a number of occasions. Sean, I'll bring you in when I finish, thank you. Um, so overall, um, and I will take comment on this, my suggestion is that 
uh, there's a rapid impact assessment taking place at the moment. Um, my sense at the moment of a lot of this is analysis, but we need to actually have something which um, uh, will, tell, will actually uh, demonstrate what we're going to do about it. So I think there's a need to, um, we haven't seen a mental health strategy that was actually pulled. So there's obviously going to have to be a reassessment of plans in the light of um, rapid impact assessment. So I suppose that's my main um, recommendation, if, if, if the rest of the committee would agree with that, that the, um, following the rapid impact assessment, there needs to be a realignment of plans to improve mental health services, including all those issues that we've just identified so did anybody um so really the, the big picture thing is uh, rapid impact assessment and and turn that into plans for uh, making a difference for people of sheffield and and seeing how we can make mental health needs meet um mental health needs and act and, and improve access that's the sort of big um, recommendation that i'm suggesting for this committee and i've also suggested a couple of the things that came up today uh, that that, that um, should be incorporated in, in, into that process. Sorry that's a bit garbled, but it has been actually a very wide-ranging discussion and Emily is going to make sense of that. Is there anything that I have missed in, in those, the whole range of, of, of things that have come up? I mean, obviously there's been a, a, a range of particular groups that have been highlighted um, who, who struggle to access services, including people with sensory impairments and so on as well. And we'd expect that to be incorporated. Steve, did you want to comment? Yes, thank you. Sort of uh, ju just for a point of clarity, sort of some of the things that are being done, sort of like clearly locally in Sheffield, and that's what this committee sort of is is, is clearly interested in. We are part of an integrated care system working across South Yorkshire and Bassett law. And for example, sort of one of the principles of that part of the the you know sort of the collaborative working is where where something sort of can be better done once about uh, over a larger footprint then you know sort of for efficiency and resources um, and for quality then we'll do that and one of the areas has been sort of about uh, about sensory sort of uh, impairment access so so deaf um, uh, particularly sort of looking at at how IAPT and mental health services might be sort of like done done more effectively and efficiently in that way. So, so that is going on uh, as well, Kate. Well, we have responsibility for a place for Sheffield, so um, that's what we, we will hold you to account for that. Um, so my suggestion is that following a rapid impact assessment that, I, I mean, I understand that the ICS is a big political, um, uh, I don't know, favourite, shall we say, but I mean, we are obviously pretty, um, mostly, focused, well, we are focused on Sheffield. Um, so anything we, we want to see in place is uh, coming from the rapid impact assessment. I'd like to really say that um, it, it, it actually addressed the needs of people in Sheffield. Um, just put into the chat that the RIA will have clear recommendations okay. because I actually chair that group. And, and at, this, at some point in the future, we'd like to have a further look at that to make sure that um, uh, it's responding. I think we'll have to go through a second phase of a lot of this stuff because we're at the analysis and the debate at the moment, and we'll want to get back. We'll want to get back to the action thing. So that's my my suggestion. Uh, we'll have another look at this because we want to see a plan after the rapid impact assessment, which is focusing on access and in, uh, in focusing on on action and improving the areas that we've discussed today. Are people in agreement with that? Okay, on that note then, can I thank, we are, we've still got another I, two items to go, on, um, but on that note, I'd just really like to thank everybody for a very um, uh, dynamic discussion and, and for our contributors who may or may not stay for the next session. Thank you very much for, 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 all, your action, uh, for all your responses and so on. And also to the, um, the voluntary sector groups, the stakeholders who responded to our um, request for evidence, because I think it's quite a good counterpoint to some of the uh, service-based stuff as well. So on that note, I'd like to um, uh, finish this item and move on to the next. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, seamlessly, we're going to move on to the next item. And, and this is very much to focus much more um, narrowly, uh, not nar not totally narrowly, but, but we're, we're actually uh, want to focus on the uh, role of the Health and Social Care Trust. 
can I just say to you, Jan and Mike, that you you, you are tiny to us um, on, on the screen because you're sitting at the end of a long table. Um, so um, that's how I didn't really see Mike and who he was. So hopefully I'll recognize him next time I see him. So if you see me peering, it's for that reason. Uh, so we've had, uh, um, where we are in the process is that uh, um, CQC have given adverse rating to the Health and Social Care Trust um, and that was several months ago pre-COVID and um, the, you have produced a, a, um, an improvement plan and you're here to tell um, the, um, the committee, the scrutiny committee about it and well in the course of that we will want to have a chat with you about the role of this committee in ensuring that um, uh, appropriate improvement takes place. So thank you for circulating uh, the presentation beforehand. I'd like to give you an opportunity just to do a, a brief introduction to that. Over to you, Jan and Mike. Thank you. Uh, I will kick off and then Mike's got a few things he wants to say and we will be brief. Um, interestingly and firstly, we it wasn't pre-COVID. We got the first draft report on the same day that Boris Johnson said we were going into lockdown. Um, and then we, um, it was made public in April. Um, but we, of course, were very, very aware of the shortcomings um, well before that. Uh, what I, I would just like quickly to say that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind or that of the board that we are truly sorry. And I do believe that we did say sorry in a number of arenas. We certainly personally wrote to all of our members and our staff uh, and we said that at public board meetings, but I'm conscious that people haven't heard that message, so I would just reiterate that. Uh, and secondly, to thank um, Mr. Short for pointing out that while we know that we have been regularly updating in a number of um, in a number of arenas um, for our staff, for our public, uh, for our members, that link you're absolutely right doesn't work. So we've put that right. So we thank you for that. Um, Mike is going to talk to you about where we are against the, the two action plans that we've got. One is around core services and the other one is around something called well-led uh, our governance arrangements. And there the two areas in particular that we, um, we were took to task on and have a number of actions to complete, some of which you'll hear from Mike have already been completed. Alan, um, may well wish to um, say something at some stage as well because he is part and parcel of the oversight committee that has been um, quite different because of COVID and because of lockdown um, but a range of people from our regulators from CQC and partners including Alan uh, are on an oversight committee who meet with us on a very regular basis to scrutinise progress against the actions um, in our action plan. So I will leave that there and hand over to Mike. Thanks, Jan. Okay, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just recap on uh, what happened and what we've done since what happened. Uh, our core services were inspected in early January and one month later the full CQC inspection uh, took place. Immediately following the inspection, uh, we were issued with an enforcement notice under 30, Section 31 of the Health and Social Care Act requiring us to stop seeing 16 and 17 year olds in our decisions unit at the Northern General Hospital. We complied with that requirement within 24 hours. Uh, about one week later in mid-February, we received a warning notice under Section 29A and the warning notice said that we had to make significant and timely improvements in four main areas. The first two, safe staffing of our acute wards and the physical health monitoring of inpatients, those to be addressed by the end of March. The third and the fourth, mandatory training of our staff and supervision of our staff, those to be achieved by the end of May. Then the full report came out at the end of April. Uh, the, the grid is in the pack of slides that we've forwarded so that people will be able to see all of the details. But to cut a long story short, the major problem areas were in our acute wards, uh, which were rated as inadequate, and our crisis service, which was rated as inadequate. And the main reasons they were rated as inadequate is that they were found to be inadequate in terms of safety and being well led. 
that safety and well-led problem uh, was visible in other services as well, uh, to the extent that the overall safe domain and the well-led domain was rated as inadequate. So we had services rated as inadequate, domains rated as inadequate, and overall we were rated as inadequate. Since then, we've made significant progress. If I go back to the section 29A warning uh, notice, this is the thing I referred to earlier that talks about uh, safe staffing, physical health, training and supervision. Uh, we have been managing this on a day-to-day -day and weekly basis uh, within the organisation to make sure we got where the CQC told us we needed to be by the time they told us we needed to be there. Uh, we are adhering to our safe staffing numbers now on our acute wards. Uh, that's a challenge and requires significant flexibility across our whole uh, system, but we are adhering to uh, safe staffing. There's some, there's some information, some graphs and figures in the slides showing that our compliance with physical health monitoring for inpatients runs at around the 100% rate now, fairly consistently. Uh, our mandatory training and supervision rates show that more than 80% of our staff are more than 80% compliant with our policies for those uh, now compared with a very disappointing starting figure. Uh, the CQC have seen all of this progress almost in real time because we have had fortnightly engagement calls with them throughout uh, COVID and the information that we've provided to you in slides have been provided to the CQC uh, on a fortnightly basis throughout uh, all of this. If I just broaden it out a bit from the particular work on the Section 29 uh, warning notice and talk about the report more generally and the, the must-dos and should-dos that we've got from the CQC, uh, as was pointed out uh, in, in the questions, there are more than 40 musts and around another 20 shoulds, making 60 in total. We've established a Getting Back to Good board, which meets uh, monthly and is responsible for overseeing and assuring the seven work streams uh, that are dealing with each of those improvement actions uh, that's required. Uh, I, I want to emphasize that all of the urgent ones, all of the ones that relate related to the, note, the warning notice, uh, we have completed. Uh, we have a remaining 12-month, uh, or we're in a 12-month program to get the whole of the job done. Uh, we're about one third of the way there already. This is uh, subject to close scrutiny and we're working closely with NHS England and NHS Improvement at what has been fortnightly uh, oversight boards, also attended by the Care Quality Commission and also attended uh, by the Clinical Commissioning Group and Alan Windle, the Chief Nurse who's on, uh, in this meeting, has been at those uh, meetings. In, a, in addition to what you might call the particular focus of the Getting Back to Good Board on CQC must-dos and should-dos, Jan has alluded to it, there, there is a, a broader and culturally based piece of work about how we lead and how we are uh, led. We've made big progress with improving our board visibility uh, and have embarked on a comprehensive uh, programme of board visits, executive and non-executive directors getting out in a systematic way to all of our services so that we can be assured and also find out how we can um, help uh, directly. And we also have much, much improved uh, ward to board uh, reporting, including the development of a new quality report, which is shortly to become a completely integrated performance and quality report. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And of course, uh, really happy to take the inevitable questions that will come through this. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Sue Austin, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the for the report. Um, I just want to focus on one area, if I can, although I could ask a few questions elsewhere. But um, my, my concern, you, you mentioned, as you've just commented, that you have now addressed the sort of staffing issues around the acute wards. Uh, and I just wondered, you also mentioned, I think in there, that staff were having to be more flexible or words to that effect. Have you actually sort of recruited more staff? Have you moved staff from different areas? And when staff, I mean, basically what I don't want to see is that you've sort of robbed Peter to pay Paul. So have we now got more staff there, um, appropriately qualified trained staff? 
And obviously for any member of staff in, in your organisation, right down to sort of the most junior, um, when these sort of reports come, it's quite demoralising. So I just wondered how you've managed to support and retain the um, the morale of your of your whole team throughout this. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. Um, uh, I'll, I'll kick off with that one, if that's okay, Kate. Thank you for asking the to cross my screen, that was off. <laughs> uh, I'll answer the second question first, which uh, is around morale. It did hit the whole organisation really hard. And I would say, while we have addressed some of those issues, if you asked our staff, they will feel still in the thick of it because we, while we have um, addressed some of the acute staffing issues uh, we certainly haven't resolved it with all our vacancies you can imagine that will take a while to sort out um, but covid has had a lot to do with lifting the spirits of our staff um, because people did really really well throughout that initial phase worked as teams people were more flexible they were volunteering and supporters in our most acute areas when they needed it most because of COVID, but also because um, they were understaffed. So they felt very, very supported by probably the real team response that we had to COVID had the knock-on effect of everybody feeling a little bit better um, and also proving to themselves because we had that where we had COVID infections on our wards through that first phase we managed to contain that really, really well. And um, our staff were proud of themselves for that. And we made sure that they were proud of themselves for doing that. So, so that was an injection um, of hope for them, I guess, really. And there's a range of other things that we've been doing to engender hope, but also to demonstrate support and um, to perhaps walk alongside a number of our leaders who were really struggling to give them support to the rest of the teams. Uh, I think we still rely heavily on bank and to some extent agency in at some of our acute areas. Those bank nurses are generally our own staff are, are on our own bank. They work with us regularly. They go through the mandatory training that all our other staff go through and are part of the team. But there is no doubt we've still got a long way to go to fill those vacancies. Mike, would you want to add anything? Uh, I'll just add as well that <coughs> we, do, we, we do have uh, 22 newly qualified nurses starting with us at the end, end, end of this month, uh, which uh, is obviously a, a really welcome development. The, 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 what goes with that, of course, is that they are newly qualified and enthusiastic. Uh, they are relative, or well, not relative, but they're inexperienced as, quali as qualified nurses. And therefore, we've put in place a really comprehensive development and support programme for them. We've also in um, increased other aspects, so psychology input, um, pharmacy input, um, and activities, so OTs, occupational therapists, and others into those areas that are particularly short staffed to improve the experience of our patients and increase the capacity of the staff who are working on the wards. Okay, Sue, are you happy with that response? Do you want to... Thank you, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was concerned that when you've got a lot of, as you said, you're bringing a lot of new staff that you can actually end up sort of making, saving one area while making other areas worse. And obviously, I don't know if there's a national issue with, uh, with availability of staff, but that's obviously a prime uh, prime problem for you. So, uh, yeah. And it is a national as well as local problem, that's for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got Jane Dunn, Councillor Dunn, and then Councillor Argencio, who's indicated. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of questions. One builds on from um, what um, Councillor Auckland said, which was about vacancies, particularly in mental health. And what plans have we got um, going forward in putting community mental health in so that people will actually see the difference? Um, I appreciate that we are in a pandemic, but we still have to plan forward for that and how we're going to do that. Um, the other question, sorry, I've had to write them down because they're not uh, slip off the tongue type questions. 
Um, the other one is, can you give me an example of how you've actually um, improved the, the reporting mechanisms, for instance, that was highlighted as one of the areas that was, that was lacking? Um, so, and really, what plans have we got forward going with the lack of staff for more community work? Because that is where I think people will really see, the public will see, just how things are changing. Thank you, Councillor Dunn. Yeah, complete, completely agree with that. And, and, and of course, the, the, the better we're able to uh, provide community services, the less likely it is that people will be admitted into a psychiatric ho hospital. So I think there, there are probably at least three main strands to this. The first is the primary care mental health uh, developments that Steve uh, talked about uh, early on. Uh, we've we're one of the, the leading innovators for that in the country uh, and, and attracted significant funding from NHS England to develop that as part of the early adopter way, not least because of the boldness of the ambition to work with VCS uh, on this and the, the VCS component of what Sheffield was saying it was going to do in primary care and community based mental health really, really stood out. So that's that's one part of it. Uh, IAPT is the other part of it, and the continued growth of, of, of that, including in the post-COVID wave, and the way that IAPT has been able to change and shift and go digital, unlike really any other service, I think probably not just in mental health, but in healthcare more broadly. The third bit is about what you might call our core community mental health team offer, uh, which was one of the areas that had shrunk over recent years, and is now being reinvested in by ourselves and our CCG colleagues. So we are appointing more care coordinators in community mental health teams. Uh, we're bringing down caseload size in order that care coordinators actually have the time to be able to do those therapeutic interactions with people that you can't, just can't do if people are overloaded uh, on, on the, their caseloads. And that's, that's heading in the right direction. Of course, that, that then puts us on the horns of another dilemma, which is that sometimes our inpatient staff want to, want to go and take up those community uh, jobs, and then we need to think about balancing the whole system. So somebody used the phrase Robin Peter to pay uh, all, uh, earlier on, and un undoubtedly that's something that we really need to be really uh, mindful of, but it can work in every way, every way around, not just in terms of drawing people towards inpatient wards, but also drawing them away, uh, away from it. I think everybody knows that if, if we're starting from scratch, that the, the investment and the getting the quality right in the community services is, is probably the single most important thing because it allows us uh, to get in earlier, to help people earlier, and to prevent people getting to the stage where inpatient admission seems to be the only thing that can uh, help. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you very, very strongly. And I think we've got at least three different areas where uh, it's not just a question of agreement and warm words, but we are actually investing, developing and, and expanding now. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, you didn't come back on the, I don't know whether one oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, back sorry. on the question yeah, about sorry. reporting. Yeah, so if I just come back on that, um, a number of things uh, which relate directly to our well-led action plan, refreshing of our governance arrangements, systems and processes, the quality of our reports, um, we have actually got more than reasonable data and information, but we weren't really presenting using it in a way that helped us understand where our risks and our so what's were. So we've done a lot of work to um, build a performance framework that will help us understand much better um, how that's telling a story about where our risks are and where we're improving. Um, against a number of things and they are being presented through um, our teams up to board and through our committees and that that is quite different um, from where we were a few months ago and that is being complemented and triangulated by the board visits and the visibility um, that we talked about earlier so people are uh, on at board and committee level are actually checking what they're reading in the reports out in be it virtually at the moment uh, out in the field okay thank you for that um 
Oh, Jane, were you okay with that? Did you want to come back? Yeah, to I just want. To, yeah, I just got another small question that I wanted to follow up on, on from that yeah. is, what services, if any, that you let slip? Have you now, you know, I'm thinking about the memory services, for instance. What work are you doing on putting those by? Because they have a massive impact in the community. And yeah, that's me finished. Thanks. Sorry, she's <laughs> by let's send you mean in the COVID sense of doing things differently. Well, it's our new world, isn't it? So I think we have to incorporate that, but not only in COVID, but for, you know, moving forward. Yeah. We, we didn't let them slip. We're just trying to work out what you mean by let them slip. Well, have you let any services slip? And what work are you doing on things like the memory services where things had like changed the, dramatically? The, the services where the, the quality had undoubtedly suffered the most were in our acute inpatient wards and in our crisis service. And that, that's where the, the lion's share of our immediate effort to rectify things has, has gone since, uh, since April. And, and the... Uh, you know, a number of pieces of information about uh, supervision, training, physical health, staffing and so on, all indicates that we're heading in the right direction uh, there, although I don't for one minute to want to create the impression that we're home and dry, we're not, this is going to be a hard slog, uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're up for it and we're on with the leadership of that hard slog. I will just say something about memory service, which is that memory service actually ran well through the COVID crisis. It went over to doing a virtual form of, of mm. cognitive uh, assessment and was able to, to, to remain open despite our, what we've observed within our own services and what undoubtedly is the national picture as well, which is that dementia is a very, very significant risk factor for potentially coming to serious harm from COVID, but we managed to keep going. I, 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 I would say as well, and this is, this is by way of balance and not at all to minimize some of the seriousness of the difficulties that we've got and the improvements that we've got to, to make, which is that we've got some good services. And in fact, we've even got an outstandingly rated service by the CQC, which is our older adult community services, which the memory service forms, forms part of. Thank you, Steve. Syndicated, you wanted to come in on this point? Thank you. I was just going to um, uh, 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 sort of stress Mike's point. Uh, memory services in particular have always performed very well in Sheffield. We have around about sort of 86 to 80, 88% of our prevalent population sort of uh, diagnosed in the city. And the memory service did indeed sort of uh, respond well sort of to, uh, to a change in, in a method of working. But it was also part of what was really the key thing, which is a cross organizational approach. So the dementia strategy sort of is involving not only the care trust, but the local authority, care homes, the voluntary sector. And that's where there's been real strength for the purpose because it's been through working together that outcomes have been sort of sustained and actually improved as well. Okay, Jane. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Gensio, Angela, you wanted to come ask a question or come in here? My question is about the impact on management, really, because uh, obviously, um, the, there was a supervision uh, that was uh, deemed inadequate and appraisal that was deemed inadequate. And I understand how the board is dealing with it from the point of view of the governance, but has this had an impact on, you know, your middle managers? Have there been many changes in staffing in that respect or a training for that staff to, you know, to compile the reports, etc.? Um, just to be really clear what we what the CQC mean by supervision, uh, the, they were talking about practice supervision and reflective practice rather than management supervision, although the appraisals fall into that. And I know uh, we use those words quite differently across health and social care, don't we? Um, so that was very much about getting our practitioner leaders to support us to... Um, support our staff to engage in reflective practice much more regularly and importantly to have the things in place to document and count that because I think that was that was one of the the issues so um, that was about our clinical leaders supporting them to do that um, we haven't seen changes in um, our manage uh, in our leaders and managers through the organization um, 
But I think one of the things that has emerged for us that we have many layers of managers, which and our staff, if you read our staff survey, they'll tell you that they they can't find their way through often in terms of decision making. And I think that is definitely one of the root causes that has tripped us up in terms of that decision making. So we may will look quite carefully about the amount of layers that we should or shouldn't have. And alongside that, um, a programme of leadership development. We've already got leadership programmes in place, but I think there's, there's room for more um, as, we, as we move into the, the next phase of our action planning. Um, but certainly the leaders and managers have had um, a fair amount of support um, and have been supportive. And and Sorry, the, I didn't look at you know, you'd finished. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. The, just to say that the results of that, we've seen um, compliance with supervision and compliance with um, appraisals really, really um, go up um, into very acceptable levels, which you will have seen from the report. Alan, you wanted to come in at this point? Yeah, absolutely, because I wanted to reassure this committee that the majority of questions that are being asked across the year are picked up through what is called the local quality review meeting where both the local authority and the CCG come together and raise so not only the action plan within relation to what we're talking around CQC, um, um, we do have local um, um, commissioning uh, meetings with the trust uh, that both Steve, Ether, ourselves um, do question quite regularly and those are now increasing. They were previously quarterly and we're moving towards a more monthly approach with the trust. So I just wanted to offer that assurance to the committee that, uh, that, that, that we work, you know, we work in tandem across the city in order to get that assurance within relation to the different aspects of training. And that was pre and post really the um, CQC inspection report. Is it possible, Chair, just for me to just interject very quickly on the, um, we have a regional, as Jan alluded to, um, the uh, instigation of a, of a, uh, a what, what is currently called a re quality risk and management oversight group. And um, that is in replacement, in, in, a, in a usual response to an inadequate um, there is usually a uh, NHS England and Improvement Regional Executive Management Team that, uh, that oversee rapid improvement within relation to trusts. Um, that was suspended due to the requirement of the NHS to respond to COVID-19. However, um, we instigated a two-weekly meeting, again, to look at some of the rapid improvement. And I think it's just worth the committee noting that both NHS England, NHS improvement, part of the NHS England relationship is also a regulator of the trust, um, along with CQC, I've, I've monitored the action plan um, on a two weekly basis and, and the feedback from that group has been quite positive on the rapid um, uh, improvements that have been made, notwithstanding that there is a lot of work to do that we can hear from the trust and from members' questions around the table. Um, but, but, but I just wanted to give a reflection of where NHS England and NHS Improvement and CQC are of the current position is that um, they have seen quite rapid improvement. And I suppose the underlying and overarching question that we're working with the trustees is, is that, um, you know, it's that sustainability of improvement that I think both Jan and um, Mike uh, you know, uh, are again alluding to in through the developments that they continue. So that's really super important. Just as a final message is that that um, quality risk management oversight, the two weekly meeting is being stood down as, um, as the COVID period, I won't say it ends or we're coming out of COVID because we're nowhere near that, but as the systems changes in response, um, NHS Improvement and England, along with CQC and the CCG, are now moving to the historical regional executive management team. So it will be an executive management team that's put in place for the continued oversight of the trust. Thank you for that. Um, 
did, did you, anybody want to come back on that? No? Okay. Um, any more questions? Any more comments? Um, I'd, I'd just like to, uh, it's a comment rather than a question. Um, we haven't seen the improvement plan, but I've looked at your trust meetings and uh, minutes and stuff like that, and, and the material that you've, you've shared us. What doesn't come, I understand that a lot of this stuff is for NHS improvement. I fully understand that's the audience for, for a lot of this stuff. But I'd just like to comment that as a, a members of the public, I think would really like to see some communication about what that means for them. And, and that's one of the things really on, on behalf of scrutiny, I'd just like to draw to your attention that in the first instance, I understand that um, this is about process and hopefully if you get the process right, you'll get the outcomes and the impact right. But, um, you know, I suppose in a way, it's following on from Councillor Dunn's question about what difference is all this actually going to make? Is it going to have a sort of, you know, an efficient organisation which doesn't make any difference to people of Sheffield? Or are there going to be um, improved outcomes and better services as a result of that? So I'd just like to um, put that point to you. And um, I just like you, I mean, I, I'm sure you'll fully understand that. And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably pushing it an open door. In terms of sort of recommendations, um, I suppose that um, firstly, is this committee, given the circumstances around the CQC um, inspection, are we satisfied at this stage with what we've heard from the Trust? That's my first question. Are we happy to note this report? Sue, so did you want to say something? I'm yeah, going just to say another thing about follow up, but just at this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I would say yes, but I would like to, I hope that we would ask for further update. We will, we will. yes, so, yes, yes. So that was just at this point, that, so I was making that sort of, are people happy that at this point that we are satisfied with what we've heard? Yes, okay, because I think it's important that we, we note that actually, but the, the second point is that we'd request a further progress report, and, and what sort of timing are we suggesting, three, six months? What, what are we, six, that's what I was thinking, is, is, are people happy with six, uh, further report in six months time? People happy with that? Okay, thank you for the nods. Can I also ask you that in that report, um, that you do give some attention in terms to, you know, what's going to be better, what difference will the public actually notice in your services? I think it would help you as well as us, actually. I can't see your expressions because you're too far away, so, um, so, it's so. Pardon? We're smiling warmly. Okay, okay. <laughs> so just like, you know, um, to make it, because I think, as I say, I think that that's something that, that would be to the benefit of, of the trust and it'd be a good outward focus with something which I'm guessing is very intensive in terms of your internal activities. So to keep that focus on, on, on what's happening out there, I'm sure you are, but it would help actually, I think, to, uh, to communicate that and, and certainly for us, um, I think we'd like to hear a bit more about that. Um, what difference that, that all these changes and, and, and you know how the pu public would, would actually public and service users would actually uh, recognise if if you actually achieve what you want to achieve. So on that note, um, any that's those are my recommendations then based on what I've heard uh, you say. And everybody happy about that? Yes. Anything else anybody wants to add? No. Okay, on that note, can I thank you very much for coming in, um, uh, uh, you know, doing your presentation and answering our questions. And it's not a question of luck, but good fortune in terms of, I hope it all goes well in terms of um, uh, the implementation of, of your plans as well. Some of it is actually, there are issues that are beyond your control, such as um, workforce availability and stuff like that. So, um, so thank you and um, yeah. Thank you. Next time. Thank you. <laughs> very much. Thank you. And um, we've just now got a single item left, um, and that's to do with the um, the work plan. I do apologise. Um, yes, Jonet. I can't hear you. You could you could you um, just eat on this item? Sorry, I didn't get you. I wanted to speak on Oh, this. okay. We haven't started it yet. <laughs> I'm going to, I want you firstly to, not to apologise, but just to say it is actually fairly unprecedented with my meeting going on so long, but I'm sure you'll agree that it's all been 
uh, because of the uh, the content of, of, of the sessions, which would be very useful and interesting. So um, the, we've got this last last um, important um, uh, item, which um, Emily is going to introduce about the work plan. We've been doing a lot of work on this since, since the last meeting. So Emily, would you like to introduce it, please? We've got some decisions to make as well. Okay. Um, so, so as you know, over the past month or so, we've been pulling together the long list for the committee's work program um, based on input from yourselves via email. Um, we've had conversations with council officers, with the CCG, with Health Watch, um, and that's essentially been put together into the long list that you've got in, in your papers today in the, in the work program report. At the same time, you'll have seen today, I've emailed out the, the kind of the schedule of meetings for the, for the rest of the year. Um, and now we're going through the process of trying to um, schedule those issues to, to the right meetings, making sure that we're bringing the issues at the right time when you can have the most value. Um, it's a bit of a juggling act um, because we want to get the timing right. It has caused us a bit of an issue with the September meeting, which we'll come back to. Um, but we're hoping to, uh, to discuss that today, um, pull, pull that together in the next couple of weeks into a, a kind of firmer schedule um, and circulate it. Um, and as always, we'll need to be flexible and able to respond to issues um, as they come up through the year. So example for today, we'll put the, um, the update on the um, Care Trust Improvement Plan in for six months. Um, so the, the list's there for you to have a look at and comment on. Um, I think that's it from me at the moment, if anyone's got any comments. Can I just sort of add to that in that um, we, we've had uh, we've had two phases to to our meeting so far. We're just finishing the first phase, which was really all the COVID related stuff that um, uh, we started off, and we didn't know when we started really how long these current the, these current arrangements would be in place. So we've had a little sort of phase over the last month or so, trying to uh, be more systematic in terms of the longer term work plan and so on. So that's what Emily's really um, referring to. We just really got to the end of that because we didn't speak to the CCG, did we, till just, just yesterday, wasn't it? So that's that's where we're at in terms of the work planning process. So is there anything um, on there uh, that, that people don't think should be on or is there anything that isn't on there that, that people think should be? So this is the opportunity for, for you to comment on the content of, of, of the issues that have come up from a whole wide range of, of, of our uh, contacts and discussions with, with colleagues. Kate, may I be really cheeky? I'm really sorry. I you think I'm, I, should, really I think I should have left by now, okay, but I haven't formally right. left. I'm okay. presuming that you don't want us to stay no, for no, this part. No, you can stay if you want, but feel free to, to, to go and thank <laughs> you very much. So this is thank still a public session, so you're, you know, you can... Thank you. You but, okay. but thank you you can and thank you everybody for your really helpful comments and uh, and support as well yeah. very much thank appreciated you. Thank, bye you. Bye. thank you bye bye everyone bye bye thank you so i've got sean ed and steve who want to comment on the work plan um i just wasn't sure where it fitted whether it fitted under the um public health legacy in in terms of the news we've had about the abolition of public health england and it's merging with track and trace. And um, I, th I think the mental health of everybody will have been deeply concerned at this move with uh, the track and trace, as we've noticed, not working as well as it might have, and public and local government having to come into the rescue, and that there's somebody who's now being put in charge who doesn't really know what they're doing. And the fact that public health is more than clearly just covid track and tracing so that needs to be reflected somewhere in the work plan uh, can i just come back on that sean i don't disagree with you i just don't think we we know enough about it yet to be whether or not we're worried about it but we'll add it to the list because sometimes what we do with things is put them on a watch list to see whether or not they develop in in, in a in, you know whether there are significant developments um, I, personally i i don't think it's going to have a big impact on on, on public health generically but then but it may do so let's just can so has everybody agreed we'll put that on the on on a sort of a long a long list and and see what's what happens and and if we feel it's it i don't i'm, I'm can you finish the point and um 
then you know we can if we put it on a add it to a watch list if there's anything significant that happens then we can rush it up the agenda is that is that all right for people yes adam did you want to come in on that point uh, yeah um I, first of all i want to say yes i really thanks john I, you put into words something that was a bit controversial but i'm really glad you did which is um the person who's actually going to be responsible for the track and trace in the absence of public health england is the person who i think has some responsibility for what we've got i do think that it is important we keep a watching brief because um what the government seems to be doing is centralizing things and then blaming local government if we don't get it right so i really do feel quite strongly that it may not be a major bit of work to put on the work program until we know exactly what's happening but i think we should have embedded it, it should be one of those things that on every agenda i think we need we need to know what's happening because we know we have a higher level of deprivation in the city than most cities we've done really well so far not to have i think we've had any additional lockdowns in the whole of south york shall we we're still having in sheffield but we've been closer to it than we would like so i don't so while it might not be a major piece of work i think we have to we, we've got to embed that in the work we do for the next couple of months so it's really just a thanks on it for a contribution and i support it thanks chair well yeah i'm, I'm you're pushing that open door i think we've agreed that we'll put it on a watch list uh so that's great thank you steve you wanted to make a suggestion yes and, and i'm not quite sure whether it would come under one of the other items or whether again it for the watch list but um in anticipation of the possibility of there may be a um a winter spike um i i'm i'm not quite sure I th I, well i think that we ought to be looking at what preparations are being made for winter pressures um and i'm wondering whether there is um that could somehow be, be fitted in as a topic for discussion um, somewhere along the line. So I agree with you that, um, in fact, when we discussed it with both with the health service and also with um, John McElraith and, and um, the adult social care uh, managers, um, it, the winter um, is, is, is complicated, isn't it, this year? Because, in fact, we could have a second wave of COVID at the same time as as um, other winter pressures and so on. So we were taking that, uh, we've got it on the work list, uh, on, in the work programme, but we've linked it up with continuing health care. And the reason for that is because a lot of the arrangements that we that have been put in place uh, to, to, to help people um, move within the system will need to be in place in order to manage either or, or both um, flu epidemic or, or an increase in, in COVID. So absolutely agree with you. And uh, it's just not completely um, explicit in the item with the continuing health care because the two are very closely linked. But we would certainly envisage that as a single session with, with those both being addressed. Is that okay or would you rather? Yeah. No, if, if it can be made a little bit more explicit when, you know, just. Yes, word. yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Yeah. What Steve had said actually, because I think it is important. Um, I know that certainly I've always chosen to pay for a flu jab each year. I had to book mine last week for one on the 1st of October. So I do think that the whole winter pressure thing is important. And we do, you know, so again, keeping a watching brief on, you know, the whole other thing that we've got through, which is the secondary health problems of COVID. We need to make sure that's not happening. So again, I know I'm pushing on the open door again, but I think, you know, Steve's right. And I think that that, and because the, the last thing you would want is people coughing and splitting with flu in the middle of a, a COVID pandemic. So I think we do need to keep an eye on it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just so complicated, isn't it? The health, you know, the, the, the modelling has been, I think, quite, um, I don't know whether to use this thing difficult or uh, the term difficult or um, abstract really because there, there's so many unknowns in the whole thing isn't it? it's very scary any other comments or suggestions what we've been trying to do right up to the last minute um when we're still on our sort of first phase um we were hoping that we were going to have the um tackling inequalities and for the um, uh, September meeting. We've just been told that public health aren't going to be able to manage that 
quite why I'm not sure, but it's not going to be as planned. Um, uh, we've just been informed that. And um, we've been trying way up to now to try and get a replacement. Did, did you get any, um, make any progress with that last item that we were chasing? No, um, it doesn't, it, I haven't today. It doesn't look like check my emails again in case. Well, what we've been trying to do is find out if there are any other items that are ready that we could actually bring forward to the September meeting, because bear in mind, we've just started on the second phase. It doesn't look like that's actually going to be the case. So unfortunately, I think we're going to have to postpone that meeting. But we will still have capacity within the meeting yes, schedule yeah. to look at all the issues that you've so identified. Now, we've set up another, is it five meetings? We've, we've, think, we've, we've yeah. put in the, another five meetings. So in fact, this year we'll we'll actually have more than our um, previous years in terms of. I think with that will be we've already had one of four. That'll be nine then, won't it? So I'm I'm not happy about that, and I do apologise, but it, it's due to matter, uh, factors that are um, beyond our control. Um, and we have actually looked to see if there's any other the other items that would be ready. I know um, I've been in correspondence, uh, particularly with Steve as as my deputy, to try and. and uh, just just to let you know what's going on we have meet, met with the um with everybody as well and, and, and um, there isn't anything that's really it there's also there's quite a lead-in to commissioning a piece of work and it actually being ready for committee so we're, we're not able to do to, to to get something which is in the right state for um the september meeting so i do apologize to the committee for that but it is beyond it has been due to factors that are beyond our control so unless you, well, I was going to say you could sack me, but unfortunately you can't <laughs> at this point. But you know, yeah, you could be nasty to me and I'll cry, but um, council are done. <laughs> Just a comment, Chair. I just wanted to say I share your disappointment in that, but I just want to thank you for the fact for how much work we've actually covered over the pandemic and the fact that we've met probably more, re uh, more regularly, I think, than any scrutiny board. And I think it's been really, really useful having them so regularly. And I think it's given the public a lot of confidence that we've been here, you know, scrutinising and been their voice. But I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor. It's been a lot of hard work. Thank you, Councillor Dunn. So I know nobody's happy about it, neither am I, but are you content to accept our recommendation that um, that, that we, we've sent out the yeah, notices for the meetings for the rest of the year, but we're going to have to postpone the public health um, uh, session and we will be slotting in the um, items for uh, into uh, the, a more detailed work plan now that we've got your feedback on, on, on the list. And the last thing is really to give some thought to do we want to set up a task and finish group on any of these issues or any others um, and we haven't actually we haven't got down to the, uh, recommending anything to you so that's something you can give further thought to and if you want to correspond with me about that before the next meeting then that's absolutely fine um, as well. Adam, Councillor. Very yeah I agree with you I think I think I'm quite I'm I think task and finish groups are a good idea as long as you know what task you want to do and what you want to finish. So again, I think with knocking on the open doors, we look at some of those issues we've raised and then consider as we make progress and find out more whether that's what we want to do. But I certainly think we should be maybe envisaging over the next three months, we may want to do at least one of those. Thank you. I told you I won't be too long. Okay. So, I mean, does anybody have any immediate proposals are I mean it's been a long meeting so I'd, I'd, I'd like to probably leave it with you um to go away and think about it one of the ones I wondered whether or not the direct payments thing might might um, uh, work better as a small group that's something for you to think about but there may be something that's not on this work plan which is more suitable for you know a bit more intensive work something which is a bit more discursive than, than these big zoom meetings actually as well that's the other thing that's quite difficult isn't it when we've got a cast of thousands we don't really get as, as much time for discussion um, as we need for, for some items. No, I'd still like to think about the social isolation because I think that's something that's going to be ongoing and is going to come in waves. And yes. when you've heard about the encouraging work that's taking place, when the improvements are happening, do you know, and I know the outcome board was doing something on it, wasn't it? And we were, do you know, but I still feel to me that is something that is so important 
we're going to have a session on um, as, at uh, Council in September as well on mm -hmm. all the uh, COVID impact stuff as well. That yeah. might generate some ideas and, and definitely, Jane, that the um, social isolation is still on the agenda, but I just, we're just sort of saying more yeah. widely that we haven't actually revisited that in the light of this work programme. So I'm not going to waffle on any longer unless anybody's got any comments. I'm going to draw the meeting to a close. And just to remind you then that, that we won't be meeting on the 16th of September and our next meeting will be on the 14th of October. Winter. <laughs> autumn, autumn. Autumn, okay. okay. Thank you for, for all your contributions on what's been a longer, longer than usual meeting. Winter. Oh, but really Bye. good, okay. really good. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers, Kate, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all.